Well, the waiting is over. The moment has arrived. And there we are on the start line, on the Reichsbrücke, which straddles the Danube, that majestic river that flows through Vienna. And there the first group of pacemakers will talk you through them in great detail. Shalane and Ed will be joining me very, very shortly. And we are just moments away, and there he is. You know, thousands, if not millions of people will be going out for a Saturday run today. Well, this could be the most famous Saturday run the world has ever seen. And it's all about this man, Eliud Kipchoge from Kenya. They're the pacemakers. Bernard Lagat is the captain. And let's just remind ourselves of the formation of these pacemakers. There are five teams of seven, and that is the open V that Ed was talking about with E.K. Elliot Kipchoge at the heart of it, and two wingmen, if you like, are behind, all guaranteed to take the wind resistance out of Elliot's performance. Five team captains. The first of them, Bernard Lagat, he's 44 years old. He's the oldest of the pacemakers in action today. The youngest is just 19 years old. And this first group will take them through to the first three kilometers. The current weather, well, almost perfect. A little bit more humid at 90% than was expected and was wanted. But uh, Eliud Kipchoge, I'm sure, will be able to, to cope with that. So we're into the final few minutes before countdown. What on earth seconds. is going through the mind of Eliud Kipchoge? How quickly, Ten. how fast is his heart beating? Five. We have liftoff. Apollo Kipchoge is up and away. And the challenge, very easy to say, to run 26.2 miles, 42.2 kilometers in under two hours. Very easy to say, rather more difficult to achieve. And they're on their way on the Reichsbrücke, traveling over the Danube, and they will be heading into the Prater very, very shortly indeed. Shalane and Ed have joined me in the commentary box. And uh, Shalane, former winner, of course, of the New York Marathon just, what, two years ago. In these early kilometers, what's most important for Elliot? Right now, Elliot is um, just completely relaxed. He is just in a state of flow. He's just locking in to the pace. Really, no mental energy is going to be wasted right now. It's um, almost kind of trying to fall asleep a little bit. He's just looking at the back of his pacers, uh, looking at the back of specifically Bernard Lagat right there. They've been practicing all week, these formations. He's very familiar with these guys. He's very comfortable. So he's just finding his rhythm, settling into pace, turning off the brain, saving all that mental energy for when it really starts to get tough and hurt, which is inevitable in the marathon. So into the second minutes of this uh, extraordinary uh, challenge here. And of course, the crowd is already building already. We're expecting 20 to 25,000 people lining the route. It's absolutely perfect. It's tailor-made for spectating here. The Prater, uh, the green lung, if you like, of, uh, of Vienna, the largest park in the capital city of Austria, is going to be packed here. It's perfect. There's not a, a breath of wind. We're looking at beautiful autumnal colours and they make their way. Ed has joined us also in the commentary box. We're going to talk about the pacing in great detail throughout the next two hours, Ed, but just give us a sense of how revolutionary this open V formation is. Well, it just looks like it shouldn't work. They're, you know, they're, they're running with this wide front and, uh, and it's a reverse V, and you think, well, how can that work? But everyone tells me that it reduces drag on Elliot and, uh, and they've done all the testing that they need to do to, to ensure that it's actually the, the optimal formation. Two men behind, of course, as we've said, and we'll uh, introduce you to the, the new teams as they come and go. The drop-in, drop-out function or system is going to be absolutely key. So we'll be making sure that we, we talk you through that. But essentially, in terms of formation, it's two at the front, two behind them, then the captain, and in this case, it's Bernard Lagat, the uh, multiple world and Olympic champion. There he is, centre picture, with all that experience at 44 years old. Elliot, of course, in the white, right at the heart of it. And then the two wingmen behind. And the way they come in and out uh, will be absolutely key. Shalane, the magic figure of 250-something has been achieved. It means they're through the first kilometre. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I mean, they look relaxed like they should, right? <laughs> they look amazing. 
Absolutely fantastic. Now, here we go. Look, the first kilometre completed, 41.2 to go. The speed at which they are travelling is quite extraordinary. We saw before the, uh, the race started, the challenge started, uh, the treadmill with various people trying to have a go. And I have to say, Ed, I'm, I'm sure you're the same. I've actually been on a treadmill at sub two hour marathon speed. I must have about 40 seconds. They had a couple of people standing behind me at the back to make sure I didn't fall off. It's going that quick. Uh, Shalane, let's talk about all the ingredients that need to go into producing this phenomenal feat. A lot of people, including Heidi Gabriel Selassie, have likened it to a recipe, if you like, for making the perfect cake. And I know you've, you've written a couple of cookery books yourself. <laughs> so let's just talk over the next couple of hours about the, the various ingredients we need to make sure that this perfect cake, this sub to our marathon, is achieved. And I guess the first thing we need to talk about is the main ingredient, a world-class athlete in tip-top condition. So, as an athlete, what makes Elliot so, so special? Well, I look at Elliot and his career started as a track athlete. He has this background and pedigree of being a phenomenal track racer. Um, I believe he's run about um, 12, 12.48, I believe, in the 5K. He has won 11 of his 12 marathons. He's run London four times, Berlin three times. He's won uh, the 2016 Rio Olympics. He has every accolade there is <laughs> um, to his name, and this is really the last barrier for him. Um, but all of that training over his career is setting up the stage for today. All of that training is accumulated into hopefully a phenomenal performance. And Ed, you, you were in Monza like uh, Shalane. Uh, what are the improvement points, do you think, essentially, when it boils down to it? That was a, a terrifically successful experiment. It needs to be bettered here in Vienna today. What are the key things that need to be improved, do you think? I think the course is slightly better. It's straighter, uh, you know, and turns are, the, are one of the things that, that hurt you in terms of time. Uh, I think that this pace formation could, could make a big difference. Um, you know, they're also wearing the most advanced shoes, so that's a difference. Uh, the uh, intake of carbs, which he gets through a drink or a gel that's taped onto the bottle, that's been slightly refined. So the important thing is that he's not going to uh, hopefully run out of fuel. So all these tiny little tweaks are helping him along. I believe um, he's consuming the Moritin um, gels and uh, fluids every 5K. Um, and um, I believe it's like about 250 milliliters is what he'll be consuming. Right, we'll see that. And we've just out of picture, we've actually got uh, Valentin Troy, who's the... Uh, the performance manager, he's the athlete manager, he will be on the bicycle, who will be handing the drinks to Elliot and, and the gels, and we'll talk you through that when it happens. We're looking for, what, about 7.50 or so, aren't we, for the, uh, the first three kilometres uh, when, when the, the pacemaker teams will change. Just a quick word about Ed, about Elliot Kipchoge, the man. We've heard how humble he is, how disciplined, how down-to-earth he is. You've spent some time out there. What is he like as a person? Well... He's, uh, yeah, he is humble. Uh, he also has to have a certain amount of self-belief and um, you know, arrogance, if you like, when he gets into races. He knows he's going to do it. Uh, so you, know, you don't win 11 out of your 12 marathons by not having belief in yourself. So he has a, a great and humble attitude to life in general. Uh, he gets on pretty well with his teammates. He mucks in with chores. You know, he's a much-loved person in his training camp and around Kenya. You know, when he's out there today, he's the boss, which is what he also gets called in camp. So, you know, he's just switched into boss mode right now. He is a phenomenal person as well as a, a phenomenal athlete, and there he is just bunched in behind the pacemakers. The absolute trust between all eight people at any one time cannot be overstated. Bernard Legat there, right at the heart of it, the initial captain, and he will be handing over shortly to the second team, and Eric Kiptanui will be the, the second captain. And there are nine stages altogether. The formation, barring any unforeseen circumstances, the formation will remain the same throughout each of the teams. And the one constant throughout of all this, of course, is Elliot himself. Elliot Kipchoge there in the white at the heart of things. Back to Elliot the person. I mean, you mentioned uh, the fact that he's a man of the people. He, he, he takes his turn, doesn't he, at uh, chopping vegetables and cleaning the toilets. He, he doesn't live at home when they're on camp. He just... Uh, lives a few kilometres away, but he insists on being part of the group all the time. Yeah, and I think that's a, you know, the key thing for him is just to keep doing the same things that have led him to this point. So he's not had his head turned by making a lot of money. 
you know, his family live in quite comfortable circumstances and he doesn't most of the time. So you can, you know, there are a lot of different athletes that might have dealt with that a different way. Um, but his way is just to keep on uh, doing the same simple things that have got him to this point. You mentioned his family. Uh, Shalane, we've got his, uh, his wife and three children here today. It's a first, his wife, Grace, and they're all watching him live in a marathon, in this case, a, a challenge for the first time. Yeah, Grace is, um, well, he calls affectionately his family the his ignition key, which is a beautiful term. Um, yeah, his uh, wife, Grace, um, he said is his main supporter. She takes care of the family farm and the three children, Lynn, Griffin, and Jordan. Um, he finds that his family is his inspiration and plays a huge role in what he's able to do. And I believe this is his, the first time his family has traveled to come to one of his races. So I think he, he wants to make sure that they're part of something historical today. And so um, I'm sure they're extremely nervous. <laughs> As a family member watching um, my family compete, um, it's always easier to be the athlete than actually being the supporting role. Well, three kilometers approaching. So we're expecting a change, Ed, very shortly of the team. Yeah, and uh, I, for one, of uh, you know, th this formation, it looks strange and it's wonderful. You know, you see Jack Rayner there with a fabulous sort of 1970s style moustache spread across his face, giving us a sort of nostalgic feel. <laughs> uh, this is a, you know, what, what the organizers are calling a kind of a K shape. Um, or a Y shape. Or a Y shape, I guess, you know. Yeah. But we have these two tail gunners here and we, uh, and all of it is to do with creating a little pocket of air around Elliot. You'll see on the left of screen there that there's the green laser. This is the laser pacer. And we are actually at the finish line, of course, waiting in, uh, well, less than two hours' time now for the crescendo, the climax of this race. And the, the, the Pacers and Elliot are just about to go in front of us for the first time. And I can tell you, the atmosphere out on the course is absolutely electric. There is Valentin Troy on the bicycle, just uh, tracking them, keeping a, a safe, respectful distance. And we're keeping an eye out here for the first changeover. They're going to go past the finish line, what will be the finish line uh, later on in the, in the challenge. And there is the, uh, the laser pacer, if you like. That is the pace that will bring him home inside two hours. And, Ed, we're approaching the time for the phase changeover. And as uh, I think Shalane was, uh, was likening, here we go. Sh Shalane, talk us through this. Yeah, I was likening it to, in the, the, the U.S., a, a NASCAR pit stop where we change out tires, you know, fine-tune um, the machine. Um, same thing goes here for Elliot. He's switching out and getting fresh runners that are hopefully smoothly transitioning into formation so that Elliot can just draft and conserve as much energy as possible. Well, you can see there Bernard Legat just giving a little hand clap and he just peels away and Ed as a first as a first transition and here's the new team taking over team two with Eric Kiptanui now taking the Legat role as the captain just ahead of, of uh, Elliot himself Ed for you how smooth was that that was pretty smooth and did you see that Bernard Legat hung around there so everyone else in the team dropped out Bernard Legat stayed in front of Elliot to give him the protection while the other team swapped in and then he swapped out last Shalane, just talk us through one or two of the highlights of this uh, second team here. Paul Chimino yeah. in the group. So Eric Kiptanui, though, he is taking a uh, brunt of the work today. He's going to be doing um, the second, sixth, and eighth um, transitions. He's a half marathon specialist who is the sixth fastest man ever over the um, half uh, marathon distance. He's run a gaudy 58-42 time that he clocked to win the 2018 Berlin Half Marathon. He's also won the 2018 Barcelona Half Marathon and the 2019 Lisbon Half Marathon. This man is, uh, is a specialist, like I said, in the half marathon, and so he's going to be doing a lot of the work today. One of the constants, actually, uh, in this, apart from Elliot, in that first changeover, is that Emmanuel Betts and Gideon Kepkata have stayed as the, uh, the, the, the wingman at the back end. OK, yeah, I was not expecting that. I thought the whole team were going to change, so um, just goes to show. Yeah. <laughs> so they've, they've, um, they're, doing a, they're doing a proper stint here. That's, you know, 10K. What is that, 29 minutes? 28 minutes, 28, roughly, right? Um, 29 minutes? Yeah. Be, yeah, something like that. So that's, uh, that's going a good lick. Um, so they're getting a workout. We're getting a good view here of the, the part that we heard in the, the build-up to the challenge starting, how, 
how important this course is. At the moment, we're on target. We will be bringing you, of course, the projected time as we go through this uh, extraordinary event. 1.59.50 is so far the projected time. An interesting hearing from uh, Valentine Tro, who's the gentleman there on the bicycle, who will be handing the drinks to Elliot Kipchoge throughout this challenge. Interesting to hear him, uh, Shalane, say that they're aiming for 2.50 pace, 2.50 per kilometre as a constant throughout the race. Yeah, and that's intriguing to me because, um, you know, I I heard that there was talk that, you know, yeah, he's going to go for sub two, but what if what if Elliot wants to run faster? Will he be able to dictate the cars and the pacers to go act actually faster than 250 a K? Um, we'll see what happens. But yeah, having a nice, consistent pace is optimal for running fast. You always want to run consistent all the way to the finish or you want a negative split where you run the second half faster than you do the first. Well, one of the big landmarks coming up is the five kilometer split. The clock approaching 14 minutes, as you can see there, bottom right of screen. And if he's on schedule, he should be hitting five kilometers in 14 minutes and 13 seconds. And as Gabby was saying before we started here, just contrast that to what the average person does, certainly in Great Britain and throughout Europe in a park run, five kilometers. Many people watching today, of course, will be watching the Ineos 159 challenge and then going out to run a park run themselves. So Elliot Kipchoge should be now hitting the five kilometer mark. Ed, how is he looking? I think he looks pretty good, but then he always looks pretty good. So <laughs> let's see what, you know, they, they say in Kenya, the race starts at 35. Um, if he's still looking good at 35, I think he's got, a, you know, a, a great shot. Um, but, you know, one of the tells that you have with Elliot, if we can uh, see him, is that sometimes he looks with his thumbs when he's very relaxed. He looks like he's brushing lint from his, uh, you know, lapels of his tuxedo jacket, perhaps. Uh, you know, you get this beautiful rhythm. And you know he's slightly in trouble when he stops brushing lint. So, um, you know, right now he looks super relaxed. And it doesn't look like uh, this pace is hurting him too much, but let's let's see how he goes. Absolutely, long way to go. And, and Chilane, for those people perhaps who've never seen Elliot uh, race before, in the final stages when most of us would be on our knees, and I think all three of us in this commentary booth have run a marathon ourselves, that's the very time when Elliot breaks into a smile. He does. It is counterintuitive. When he is hurting most, he has a giant smile across his face and people think like, oh, what is he giggling at? Like, what is going on here? But that's his way of trying to trick his brain to lean into the hurt and to try to not recognize the pain that he's putting himself through. But that is the telltale sign that everyone knows when Elliot is hurting, he's actually smiling. I also think he might actually do that when he's in a very close race as well. Sometimes he, I remember when he was in this big fight with Wilson Kipsang in the, in the London Marathon, and he shot him a big smile when he, <laughs> when he took it near the end. That would be intimidating. That would be intimidating. Well, we talked about Elliot the athlete. We've talked a little bit about Elliot the person. Of course, a bigger a factor, and we go back to our little uh, metaphor of the, of the cake and what all the ingredients that go into make this. Uh, we're approaching the first of the roundabouts here. This is the Must House. This is the smaller of the two roundabouts. So essentially, uh, in image terms, we're, we're looking at like, like a, a dog's bone, if you like, with a straight piece uh, along the middle, which is the, the part of the Hauptallee. And they're now going around the smaller of the two roundabouts, the Lust House. And in the middle of that is a, a former hunting lodge. And it was uh, badly bombed, actually, during the Second World War and then rebuilt in 1948. There it is. There is the Lust House. And it's now, Shalane, a place to, uh, to grab coffee. It's a, a cafe and a restaurant. And I think we may all be going for breakfast, actually, afterwards. Oh, uh, and maybe Ellie would join us. Yes. Um, I think it's important to note, too, with these lines that you're seeing in the road, that these lines are actually for Elliot, that he does not cross over the line, because if he did cross over the line, he would technically be DQ'd because he'd be running less than the marathon distance. So these lines that are in the road are not for the pacers, they're for Elliot to make sure he doesn't cross over. You can just see the first time that uh, fluid has been passed to Elliot. You can see him in the white, just shielded by the pacemakers, taking on board the vital fluid and gels that he needed. Then he's handing it back to Valentin Troy. And now what happens? So interesting, he was handed off at about 6K instead of 5K, but that may be more just the logistics of getting around the actual roundabout. Um, 
but yeah, he just handed, I believe, one bottle, maybe a gel. Um, we've heard that he's going to be taking in gels and fluids. So. Okay, you can see the, the, the recent splits there. The 2.50 mark in green means that he's on schedule for a sub to hour marathon pace. 2.52 and 2.51 in the red means he's just outside. He's been twice on target and twice just outside. Overall, look, eight seconds inside. It just shows us, Ed, even in these early stages, just how challenging it is. Yeah, I mean, I th they want to run even splits, but it is impossible to run completely even kilometers one after another. So what we're talking about here is someone trying to, uh, you know, get as close as they can to 250 for as long as possible. As things stand, he is uh, eight seconds in. The speed here, it's worth, uh, Shalane, just reflecting on this and just trying to put it into some sort of layman's terms. He is going to be running or trying to run consistently at 13 miles an hour, 21 kilometers an hour. Extraordinary. We were trying to think last night, where we uh, over dinner, about an everyday example of what that speed looks like. And in, I mean, in London, where I come from, the average speed, I think, of a London bus and traffic in central London is only about eight miles an hour. Have you thought of something that, that will illustrate that? Yeah, I mean, I, same thing. I think about, you know, what a cars would roll through a neighborhood and through my neighborhood and thinking that Elliot's running as fast as the cars rolling through my neighborhood. It's mind-blowing. You know, I challenge people to go out. That just goes to show, um, you know, and Elliot has to do that. Um, 105 times. Yes, I was. thank you for doing the math. 105 times. Yeah, we can, so, <laughs> we can break this down in so many ways, can't we? Yes, one lap of the track if you go down to your local track 68 seconds and he has to do that 105 times and as we heard earlier on each hundred meters in 17 seconds and he will be doing that 422 times let's get a, a view of the next pacemakers the next group of pacemakers team three who will take them through eight kilometers to 13 kilometers are waiting here the captain of this team will be uh, brett robinson and it features all three of the Inga Britsons. This is really remarkable. You know, it was very fun to have all three of these Inga Britson brothers from Norway uh, in the same 5,000 meters, uh, you know, race. And, and now they're all part of the same team here. Um, this is one of the really cool things about this event is that people come from, you know, they come from 10 different countries uh, and they're all part of this one project. Um, and, th you know, the story of these brothers is remarkable anyway, that they're all world-class athletes. Um, so to have them all in the same uh, t same team is really something here. Yeah, and the Ingebrigtsons just came off of the World Championships in Doha, where they competed um, in the 5,000 meters and 1,500 meters and had had a great World Championships. Maybe you were hoping to come away with um, more medals, but you know they've extended their season to come here and help Elliot, and um, I think that's tremendous. The last K, the seventh K, was in 2.48, so we are under prescribed schedule right now. Yeah, and just a couple of seconds makes all the difference, so we've just given ourselves a little bit more uh, margin for comfort here. 10 seconds inside, sub to our pace so far and we're heading towards the eight kilometre mark. Ed, just a little update on what we read into the facial expression and the body language of Elliot himself. Yeah, I think he looks smooth. Um, it doesn't look like he's hurting too badly. He, you know, there, this is, will be a tumult of exertion. There's just no other way to look at it. He's going to spend two hours working really hard. But what he's trying to do is tamp down those, those feelings. Shalane, has actually done this, uh, you know, at a professional level and won big marathons. And I wonder what it actually feels like when you're when you're in this situation. Yeah, these early stages, I'm thinking about all about conserving energy because it's inevitably going to get hard. But you're always hoping that you're having an on day and that the hard doesn't get hard to the very end. Um, no matter what, once you hit about 30 to 35 k. Um, reality sinks in that you're running a marathon and that you're running very fast and you know Elliot is attempting unknown territory each step that he's taking is towards history he is racing the clock and running towards history so there's a lot of motivation to nail this and get it dialed in and here we approach um, the third transition here team three just about to take over the captain brett robinson and uh, again we'll introduce you to the members of uh, team three but it's again another very smooth transition there we can say Herrick, henrik ingebrigtsen philip as well and jakob center of picture all fresh as uh, shalane was saying from the world championships in doha again marks out of 10 ed for that transition i think that one was the best one yet 
agree. That looks so smooth. You know, it could be that the fact that three brothers are so accustomed to running together, but that looked really smooth. And the crowd appreciated it as well. You can hear them tapping on the sides there, absolutely fully dialed in. So let's introduce you to this uh, new team. Team three, remember, there are five teams in total, and we've not got one, but two, but three. Inga Britson, Shalane, just pick out one or two of these for us. Well, so Brett Robinson actually is the team captain. He's the Australian. Oh, Henry. Stanley Cabernet as well from Kenya. There are 15 Kenyans across the 41 pacemakers. There is uh, Philip Ingebrigtsen as well, the middle brother, and uh, Jakob as well. Uh, Jakob is uh, the youngest of the three Ingebrigtsen brothers. Um, and then we also have Brett Robinson, who I said is uh, the team captain. He's from Australia. Um, it's quite a collection, isn't it? And we've changed the wingmen, Ed. Uh, this time we've got uh, Kip Sarem and uh, Jonathan Correa now operating as the uh, the bottom of the Y. I think um, in an absolutely ideal situation, they would run it, be running a bit closer to each other, the wingmen at the back. Um, apparently that's what, what helps, you know, prevent the wash. Um, but, you know, I think everything is... Uh, everything looks pretty good here. And, I, you know, I think the main thing is that Elliot stays quite close to the guy that's in front of him, the captain. I think that's the kind of key the key part of this of this formation. Well, well, let's hear from one of the uh, the pacemakers. Let's hear from Emmanuel Bett, who's been talking to our reporter, Kristen Arnold. Emmanuel, that formation, why does it work so well? Uh, that formation is very excellent because when we go in that V-shape, it really assists Elliot and gives the pacers uh, to, ha to attain the 250 mark per kilometer. So I think that strategy is very nice, especially towards the target of 159.59. Yes. Have you given Elliot the best possible chance at the start? Exactly. I hope everything will go well. Yes. So I have confidence the way he was, he was running because I was looking from behind. If it goes, all, everything goes like that. Excellent. 159. 59 would be capable. And how, how smooth was that first transition? It was nice. Everything was in order. It was organized. The Pacers are really catching up with the, uh, that, with the formation. Yes, exchange formation. Emmanuel, thanks for chatting to us. Go and recover. Thank you, too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Well, Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, Emmanuel. Yes, his work is done for the day because he, uh, he took on the first two uh, teams and was uh, one of the two, two wingmen. So uh, Emmanuel Bett has, has done a great friend. There we've just got a great shot of the, uh, the Hauptallee, the main stretch. And it's worth just reiterating, Shalane, that 90% of this entire course is flat and straight. <laughs> yes, you couldn't ask for a more flat and straight road and that is prime for fast running um, anytime you have to make turns is when you actually are slowing down so they've minimized the amount of turns the target time holding up pretty well we've been hovering between eight and ten seconds inside sub two hour pace so far so far so good and ed the next real milestone will be the 10 kilometer mark and uh sub to our pace would put him on what 28 26. Yeah, which is a pretty tidy 10k, uh, and he's got to do it forward a bit times. <laughs> do you mind me being rude and asking what your best 10k time is? My best 10k time is 37.22, I think. Uh, so I have, um, yeah, I would be going some. <laughs> I wouldn't make, I wouldn't make 500 meters with these guys. Shalane? Mine is uh, 30.22 from the Beijing Olympics. So yep, not even close. <laughs> well, you're just better than me, Shalane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So approaching 10 kilometers, so we'll be there in, what, a, a minute and a half. Uh, and just a word about this, this wonderful Hauptallee. You can see there the chestnut trees that line. It provides a natural protection, doesn't it? As well as being highly beautiful, uh, particularly at this time of year. But any sense of any wind is really protected by these, these wonderful chestnut trees. The Prater Park, um, they call it the Lungs of Vienna. Yeah, I think the that's green such lungs. a beautiful yeah. term. But yeah, it's... it's the trees are literally oxygenating the air, is protecting from any potential wind. However, you don't see any of the leaves moving outside today. It is still as can be. 
I feel like with the fog and the you know the leaves on the turn and we're in Vienna, it feels like a kind of Cold War thriller. You know, it's uh, it's got this feeling of sort of mystique about it today. Like yesterday was this gauzy sunshine, and uh, it was very beautiful. A lot of families out in the park and people running up and down the Hauptallee. And today feels like you know there's something going on. Mystical. Yeah. Yes. Well, we've got the Riesenrad, which is the Ferris wheel. We may get a glimpse of that at some point during this challenge, but uh, that's at the far end, and that's the iconic ferris wheel that appeared in the third man written by graham green so there's there's historical references all around this course and uh, hats off to the research team who scoured the world we heard at one point that perhaps london was being considered as the main venue to hold this this challenge and uh, as we've had heard no stone was left unturned in terms of searching for the ideal venue i think we can see to see today that they've got it spot on here in vienna it really is the most naturally uh, appropriate venue for this. Just have a moment here to think about how good this looks. Take away how fast they're running. These guys just look incredible, especially when you get that, you know, the front-on shot, and you see, you, you know, you see these guys running so fast, 13 miles an hour, and the kind of ease in the stride. I think, you know, Philip particularly and <laughs> Jakob look so good when they're when they're on the. They make the, it look so easy, don't yeah. they? But reality is they've worked so hard to make it look so easy they've just upped the pace a little bit we're actually at 13.3 miles an hour and we should also say that we've mentioned how world-class all of these pacemakers are just a sense of privilege to be included and invited to take part you really feel that from the the chats we've had with the pacemakers well they definitely are here because they want to be here no one's forced them they're here you know they're here because they wanted to be involved with this and i remember from monza that feeling afterwards, you know, it was a near miss. There was still kind of a party atmosphere. Oh, you know, for sure. When he finished, I don't know if you remember, but they lifted Elliot and carried him on his shoulders. They all idolize and look up to Elliot. And I think they look at this as a chance to be a part of history today. And, you know, it's, it's a beautiful opportunity to, um, to help someone that we know can transcend our sport. One of the things about it is, I think, you know, it, we touched on this a few times, you know, Elliot is part of a team. He does train with other people. But when it comes down to it, you, you start on the, you know, on the start line and you're on your own. This feels more like a kind of Ryder Cup moment or, um, you know, it's a team, it's a, it's a team moment in a, in a sport that doesn't normally have teams. Yeah, so, they're looking to be a part of something bigger than themselves today. Yeah. And also quite fun to run. You don't want to be the guy that messes up, but also quite fun just to run with nothing personally on the line for you yourself. You're just running for someone else. I think actually that might be quite of a stress relief. It is. I mean, it's a thrill. It's, it's nice to have that motivation to run for someone else and um, really allow them to fulfill their dreams because you helped out. That's a great feeling. Well, uh, going round the, the second, the larger of the two roundabouts, this is the, uh, the Praterstern, which is at the northern end of this dog bone that we've uh, described the course as. And the crowds, again, really thick, several deep on all sides. And I have to say, here on the, uh, the Haptali itself, the atmosphere is absolutely electric. We're going to bring you uh, the latest splits uh, per kilometre as soon as we can. But so far, so good for Elliot Kipchoge through 10 kilometres on sub two hour pace and uh, if you're just joining us here and wondering what's that funny laser green line that's the line that is guiding the pacemakers on sub two hour pace that will get them inside two hours on 159.59 or even better we hope Shalane. so 11 kilometers completed half an hour of running so we are a quarter ed of the way through and he's now fully warmed up and uh, into his running yeah you'd say he'd be warmed up by now <laughs> half an hour um i mean all he's hoping for the first three quarters of this is to is to keep on schedule you see sometimes the the kilometer splits drift out for a kilometer then they come back i think he won't be too worried about that um you know what what you worry about is if they start to drift inexorably but but he'll be, he'll be thinking right now this is you know he's on schedule and uh, he doesn't look 
I don't know what you think, Shane. He doesn't yeah. look like he's been, he's having too much trouble here. Oh, no. I mean, well, first of all, Elliot is just a beautiful runner. And even when um, he does break down, it's, it's very, very small increments. But um, the fact that he's within seconds of his goal predicted time um, right now is is not a big factor. Is if we saw that the splits were starting to drift backwards continuously, but they're not. They're just fluctuating by a second, second faster, second on, maybe one second slower. That's really nothing to worry about right now. Um, as long as the overall time is where we need it to be is what is important. We can make some comparisons with how he was going in Monza and actually up to halfway he was inside sub to our pace and at halfway exactly he was three seconds inside and then at 25k he was still two seconds inside even at 30k he was only two seconds outside sub to our pace and he admitted afterwards that it was in the final 10k when he really started to feel it and that's when physiologically the body starts to break down and do some strange things and you've, you've yes. all experienced uh, it, it's where the marathon truly does start it's when you begin the race is 10k to go and um it's all just um you know, a foreplay to get to that spot where you're going to be having to race the last 10K. So this is just all setting up the stage. This is just the, the foundation, but the real running and the real race begins. This is the undercoat and the primer before we apply the gloss yes, later on. Yes. Yes. Um, what about negative split? Very much the modern way, isn't it, in what we could call traditional marathon running where we have a competitive race. This is very different here. If we believe the information we were getting at the start of the race, we're going for 250Ks throughout. Does that mean that negative splits don't come into it here? Well, I would just, I mean, I would temper that slightly. We say everyone always talks about a negative split as being the best way to run a marathon. Very few people actually do it. You know, it's very, it's a hard thing to do because you feel worse at the end when, you know, when you're meant to be going quicker. For those people watching who don't know what we mean by a negative okay, split. Okay, so a negative split is when you run the second half of the marathon quicker than you run the first half. And we're only talking about, you know, a few seconds here. Um, you know, the, the organizers and, and Elliot himself have, you know, come to, the, come to the conclusion that, you know, an even split, first half, the same speed as the second, is going to be the most efficient way to do this. So... You know, we'll see what he goes through in halfway in, but if it's something like Monza, you know, 59.50, something like that. 59.57 in Monza. 59.57. So I would think he might be a couple of seconds inside that if he's on if he's on schedule here. As then, an athlete, I would want a cushion. I would want a few seconds under and um, hope that, you know, I can maintain or even close faster. But um, for sure, I would want to see something under the 60 minutes when I went through halfway if I were Elliot. When you ran your fastest, did you run a negative split? Um, yes, I, well, actually, good question. <laughs> um, I think I was going for the American record in Berlin and I may have actually positive split, to be honest, but I think I went out a little too aggressive for my fitness. But you have to find out where you're at, right? Like you have to find out what you're capable of. So sometimes you have to push that barrier. Um, I think this is a little bit more calculated. I think they know exactly what he's capable of. Um, and that's the whole point. We're going to find out what he is capable of, and that's what he wants to know. Yeah. He, po he posted this little thing on, on uh, Instagram last night, um, which was, you know, he wants to, f you know, he wants to find out where the limits are. Well, he's about an hour away from <laughs> discovering, I think. And we've talked a lot about why this won't be a world record. And again, for those people who are, who are just joining us, uh, Shalane, there are three primary reasons why, if he does it today, it will be an extraordinary achievement. It will be an historic achievement, but it won't be a world record. Just remind us of why that is. Yeah, there are three um, vital factors here why it would not be considered a world record by the IAAF. The first one is... Elliot is the sole competitor in this race and in this challenge. Um, in order for it to be ratified, there has to be more than one competitor. These pacers don't count as competitors. In fact, um, the second reason is having pacers coming in and out of the race um, also violates the rule. Um, they'll be interchanging. Um, and then the third one is the fact that the fluids will be handed to Elliot via a bike and not picked up traditionally like in a major marathon um, on a table. So those are the three reasons why it will not be ratified as a world record. And Ed, I was reading actually, and you're a, a historian of, of the marathon distance, there was a point at which actually it was illegal to take on any fluid within the first 10 miles of the race. And had somebody done that at that time in history, that would have invalidated any time, any world record. 
Yeah, the rules have changed in interesting and complicated ways over the years. You know, there was a race in, uh, in St. Louis, uh, the Olympic marathon, where the guy that, that uh, won the race was on strychnine, which was rat poison, you know, and he, you know, the, he was not strictly ushered to the anti-doping tent at that point in 1906. So, you know, there have always been, always been changes to the way that these things are regulated. Um, I think the most obvious transgression of the rules is the, is the pace setting formation. We're about to head to team number four, who will take us through the pacemaking team led by uh, the Swiss Julien Vanders, and they're standing by waiting for what we hope will be another uh, smooth transition. So team four standing by, and let's see how smooth that transition is. Here they go, Shalane, talk us through this one. Yeah, I'm watching the execution, looked really smooth. Um, we have in uh, the arm sleeves, nice choice today by Lopez Lamong, um, who's actually a teammate of mine and I, I help coach at the Bowerman Track Club. Um, he's a multi-Olympian. Wow, that was a great transition. I love that. Now uh, we have one of our only um, athletes from Japan in this team. Yeah, Lopez Lamong, like I said, of the Nike and USA, uh, the Bowerman Track Club. Uh, Patrick Tiernan of Australia. Um, Shadrach Koic as well. It's a truly international team, Mariyama from, from Japan. Do you know what? You're not going to get a lot of windbreak out of uh, Shadrach Koic. He's quite a little guy. <laughs> I'm pleased they didn't stick him in as the captain right in front of Elliot because he would have got about, you know, his, his chest up would have been I'm uh, taken away. I'm curious if that was a consideration um, Oh, it must size. be, right? Must be. Yes. I mean, but if you were just thinking about that, you'd get Lopez Lamont right in front of uh, Elliot. He's like, he's pretty True. tall. True. Yeah. Jonathan Career, one of the, uh, the anchor men at the back, a really long, lifelong friend of, uh, of Elliot Kipchoge. We got a glimpse of Elliot Kipchoge there, side on. And uh, I wonder if we'll just get a, a glimpse of his uh, facial expression just to read into how he might be feeling at this stage. But uh, we've had what? We've had three or four transitions so far. Ed, generally speaking, how pleased are you with the way the, the pacemaking teams have come in and come out? Drop in, drop out, as it's called. Well, uh, you know, this event was always going to have a bit of ballet about it. And, you know, you needed everyone to know, <laughs> to know what they were doing, what their steps were. Um, I think for the most part, they've been pretty good. The, you know, the... The, the idea is that Elliot spends as little time out of the formation as possible. And if you've got eight changeovers, that's 10 seconds a time when he's not in formation. So, Well, Henrik Ingebrigtsen is one of those pacemaking team. He's just come off and done his duties. He's been speaking, or he's now with Crystal. Henrik, it's special as an athlete to be involved, but also special as a family. Of course, it was uh, like an everyday workout to me and my brothers, trying to stay in formation as we normally do in our training. And how pleased with you, were you with how smooth it went? Um, I think uh, our team did uh, a very good job. Um, we were a little bit uh, surprised that uh, the laser jumped a little bit, but not uh, completely uh, prepared for that. But other than that, I think the turn went uh, as smooth as it could have been. And, uh, and also, uh, I think uh, all in all, uh, job well done for our team. So Elliot's on track. What about you and having to extend your season for this event? Of course, I, I feel happy to be part of this. And, uh, and um, of course, uh, being able to uh, participate in an event like this and also helping the marathon improve uh, as an event, uh, I feel, uh, feel happy to be part of this. Great chatting to you, Henrik. Thanks. Well, it's been a long season, but I'm sure they won't have missed this uh, for the world, particularly if history is made today. If you're just joining us, you're very welcome indeed. We could be seeing history unfolding here on the streets of Vienna in the part of this uh, famous park, which runs pretty much parallel to the majestic Danube. And we are 14, 15 kilometres into this challenge. It's not a race strictly, it's a challenge, it's an attempt to run the first ever sub two hour marathon and the man at the heart of it is the man in the white vest there, Elliot Kipchoge from Kenya, this supreme athlete, the 
simply the best marathon runner the world has ever seen. He's the Olympic champion. He's already the world record holder. And he is surrounded by his band of brothers, the pacemakers. We've got 41 in total, 35 who will be active in different teams here today, six in reserve if we need them. And uh, Ed, with your writing head on, you've described this as uh, something of a, a Swan Lake affair. Yeah, Swan Lake meets Chariots of Fire, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> it's... Uh, it's, it's partly because of the choreography, but partly because of the colors. You know, Elliot's in white and these other guys are in black. Um, I just think it, you know, aesthetically, it looks very interesting. And, you know, what I love is, you know, the lasers are pouring out this, this place on the road where the, where the guys have to find their marks. You know, imagine having to do all this running at 13 miles an hour. You know, we're, we're talking about, you know, a pace that would be crazy for most people, even very fit club athletes, to to consider and you're having to absolutely hit your spots 12 centimeters to the left or the right you know you're you're not doing your job absolutely right and as uh, Shalane mentioned there is uh, there are parallel you can see them now on the tarmac those parallel lines in orange which um, they have to keep within of course down the Hauptallee that's very straightforward but it's actually when they go around the two roundabouts at the either end of this course so that becomes crucial yeah those lines are made for Elliot so that he does not cross over so that he stays um, in the valid zone for running. If you were to cross over one of the lines, that would create an invalid race because he would be running a, a shorter tangent line than the actual distance of 26.2. They're through 15 kilometers. Yet another little landmark has been achieved as they go around the Lusthaus once again. This time they're going anti-clockwise. This is the smaller of the two roundabouts and you can see as Shalane has just been saying that although the pacemakers can go either side of the orange line Elliot has to stay within it yeah and you notice when they're going around these roundabouts they're actually losing the green line and I think that's what Henrik was saying in his interviews that he was a little surprised I think they lose the green projected line when they turn see it just came back on right there so I think it was a little bit of a deception they weren't I think prepared <laughs> to lose their line so they have to just guess and you know, what pace that they're running, but clearly it's it's not deviating too far. If you've spotted any little bits of moisture on the camera, don't worry, it's not raining here in Vienna. The perfect conditions continue. It may be a little bit of condensation. If you were with us earlier on, you'll have seen that we had some early morning mist, which uh, rose really mysteriously and just added to the aura and the sense of excitement here. But uh, conditions continue to be perfect. The only slight question mark here, just worth reiterating, although uh, temperature was almost perfect, the, the level of humidity was perhaps a little bit higher than we were expecting. Yeah, they were not expecting that a couple of days out. And I think, you know, when I, when I came down here yesterday morning at about 7.30 or 8 to run on this track, that was perfect in my you know there was a kind of gauzy little bit of sunshine it was very still uh, the temperature was exactly right today feels like a different proposition the temperature is good the temperature is good well the pacemakers continue to do their job and they have been expertly put together and assembled by Spencer Barden, who is uh, a very well-known figure in marathon running circles. He's the uh, elite director for the London Marathon. He's been uh, heavily involved in choosing and training and forming these pacemakers, and he's now with Crystal. First things first, Spencer, is it going to plan? So far, all is going to plan. So uh, early, early days yet, still a long way to go, but the, the exchanges have gone very well so far. Uh, Elliot's on, on pace, so, uh, so far, so good. I'm interested in the conceptualising of the formations. Can you take us through that process? Yeah, so we've done a lot of work uh, in the build-up to this event in terms of looking at the formations, what was best for Elliot, what we're giving the most uh, protection out on the course. So we've come up with a... It's not a conventional formation. Uh, we've done a lot of testing with the athletes at the test event and here in the last couple of days. Um, but we've got a fantastic group of world-class athletes. So they're, 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 they're relishing the opportunity and they're, they're working well in the formation, communicating with each other. Uh, and so far, it's uh, all going very well. And we've seen you communicating with the athletes before and after. What is some of the feedback that you're getting? Just some final instructions, really. Uh, just more to relax, don't panic. Uh, if, if something does go wrong, just, you know, work it through. Uh, don't get in a situation where the important thing is not to not to trip or, or, or trip each other or trip Elliot. They just got to stay relaxed. Um, you know, maybe something will go wrong. Hopefully not. But uh, the guys are experienced and they know what they're doing. And the crucial parts come a bit later. 
Absolutely, yeah. We go we when the athletes start to get tired, and Elliot starts to get tired in the latter stages. That's when we need to really, really focus on uh, on, on you know what we're doing. So certainly the last sort of 10k, you know, 30k onwards. That's when it's going to get going to get tough. But we're, we're in a good place. All the best for the rest. Spencer Barton there, feeling and sounding very confident indeed, but there's an awful long way to go. And of course, the deeper into this race we get, the harder it becomes. Look at that for pacing, Shalane. Absolutely bang on the money. They asked for 250s, and in the last three kilometres, that's exactly what they've got. <laughs> Beautiful execution of the pace. Um, but to be expected, these guys are professionals, and um, they're setting it up for Elliot. You're a world-class uh, marathon runner yourself. You've won the New York Marathon. Can you feel, do you know what it feels like to run, not necessarily 250s, that's a superhuman, but if you were <laughs> running at, say, 3s or 310s or 320s, does your body inherently know what that feels like? Well, you train the body and you train the mind. Elliot has been preparing for this moment, well, his whole career, but specifically the last four months. There are things he's been doing in training to um, increase his threshold and to allow him to be a better athlete. Um, you know, he, he, I guess, at the beginning of the season, four months out, started doing some gym sessions, which he'd never really done. Um, they spanned about two and a half hours, three times a week. He wasn't doing a lot of mileage yet, so he was getting in the gym to build strength. In fact, they were doing some fun aerobics and step dance um, mixed with lifting and stretching. Um, in fact, the, there's a great video if you go to the Ineos website uh, where you can see them all step dancing and having a fun time. Um, he also upped his mileage from about 118 to 130K um, to 124 to 120 or 140 miles, I should say. Yeah, so there have been one or two tweaks uh, in the preparation. We should just go back from the streets here of uh, Vienna, Ed, for a moment and, uh, and uh, propel ourselves eight, eight and a half thousand kilometers into Kenya, into the Great Rift Valley. I think all three of us have, have had the privilege of going up there. The conditions clearly very, very different there. Let's just uh, actually, let's park that thought for the moment. Another transition about to come up. We're about to hand over to the next team. And uh, this is team five. This is the next changeover. They'll take them through from 18 to 20. 23 kilometers and the captain Shalane of this team, Team 5, a man you know very well indeed. <laughs> yes, teammate of mine of the Bowerman Track Club, Matt Centrowitz. Centrowitz is one of the most decorated middle distance runners of, of our generation and he's current uh, Olympic 1500 meter champion. He's 20, 29 years old, soon to be 30 and um, a team captain. He's a great communicator. Um, he loves to talk for sure. If anyone knows Matt, he's a talker. And there he is slipping in. Blocking Elliot. Matt is a great athlete to run behind. He is so smooth. And as an athlete, you always like to run, run really nice behind uh, the clean runners that have uh, as little back kick as possible. They have just run in front of our commentary position, and I kid you not, blink and you miss them. It was an absolute blur, Red. They are something else to watch. I love watching Matt Centrovic run. Right? Yeah. It's beautiful. It's, it's so effortless. Yep, he just came off of the World Championships. He ran a 3.32 in the final. Incredible. We also have uh, Shadrach Kipchichir from the USA. He was also in Doha. Hilary Bohr from the USA. Noha Kipkinboy of Kenya. Chela Ragasa. Yeah, one of two Ethiopians in the team. And Matt Centrowitz of USA, the captain, right in front of Elliot. Salomon Borega of uh, Ethiopia. Yeah, the 19-year-old silver medalist in the uh, 5,000 meters in Doha. And our last one, Moses Koek. So it's all change. Ed, I I'm just wondering, was that perhaps not the, the smoothest of the transitions we've seen today? Yeah, I think that was, you know, you saw the way that um, Matt Centrowitz just had in his mind he was going to shield Elliot right from the very first moment so he even shifted across with him that was very cool um, they seem to be executing these really well you know what the thing that to, to look for is you know I think it's Eric Kipton who's got to do three of these 
you know, it, he's been asked to basically do a, a rep session where he does three times 5K at 14.30, <laughs> you know, with the long gap in between. Let's see how good their changes are the third time he has to do it, you know, because there's going to be fatigue. The athletes will be, you know, the paces will be The paces be are going to be getting perfect. fatigued. Yeah. So, so, you know, the first ones you'd hope would be really good, everyone be on their toes. Um, the real skill is going to be to do it when you're tired. Well, the current captain of uh, this latest team, Matt Centrovitz, has uh, just started his journey. The previous captain, Julian Vanders from Switzerland, who spends a lot of his time up with uh, Elliot in Kenya, he's with Crystal now. Julian, as captain, tell us about that role and how crucial it is for today. Yeah, my role as a captain is uh, very important because actually Elliot is supposed just to follow me. So he's not supposed to think about anything, just follow me. And I also have to lead the guys in front of me. So if they are not on the line, I have to tell them, uh, stay on the line, go a bit more in front. And uh, also it's important in the roundabout because this is a little bit uh, tricky. There is no lane anymore with the laser. So I have to keep the, the right lane so in, in the inside as much as possible so that we don't lose time on the roundabout. Yeah. So special to be in this event, but running almost to make Elliot's dreams come true. Yeah, it's a, it's a big honor. I think all of the pacemakers are so happy to be here. Uh, it's a privilege. And, uh, you know, uh, for us, we are just a small part. I mean, running 5K is nothing compared to, uh, to 42 kilometer. And uh, I, I can say it's a big, big inspiration. And I think uh, he's really showing that uh, there's no limit in his mind. Yeah. Julian, you have such a connection to Kenya. I love your bracelet. It says run in Swahili. Tell us about Kenya, the experience of training with Eli. Uh Yeah, so for me, I live in Kenya for now four years. Uh, I don't train with Elliot, but uh, not far in Iten. And I have an amazing group to train with. Uh, we push each other every day, and I, I just like the mentality of the Kenyans. It's just uh, so amazing, so inspiring, and it has helped me to improve so much. And I think I just find the right environment for me. I just feel like I'm Kenyan now. And judging from what you picked up from Elliot along this section of the race, do you think he's on track? Yeah, definitely he's on track. For now, he, he just uh, I think he's feeling easy because he's not even at halfway. Uh, what I admire is the, con the focus, the concentration. And you know, with the pacemaker coming and going out, it's not easy. So he has to be also very focused. And uh, I think he will do it. Uh, I, it's not even I think, I'm sure he will do it. Thanks, Julian. Asana Santa, Julian Vanders there, a native Kenyan now, originally from Switzerland. So 19 kilometers completed. The next milestone, of course, will be the 20K mark. 56.52 would put him bang on course. So we've got a couple of minutes ahead. Let's just go back to the Great Rift Valley and what it's like uh, up in uh, El Doret and uh, Kaptabat. Uh, there's the latest splits coming through, 250s, and they've just slightly increased their 248 Shalane uh, for that latest kilometre. Um, I mean, they're right on target. We'll get our... Yeah, it says on, on target. I think it says uh, under 11 seconds, but we'll, we'll get the real feedback when we hit 20K. Like you said, we want to be 56.49. Yeah, 56.52 uh, or something thereabouts for 20K and uh, 59 57 through through halfway so the next uh, milestone will be uh, halfway uh Kapt Kaptagat, uh, 2400 meters at altitude here we are in vienna 165 meters above sea level the conditions up there red very very different just take us there yeah the only similarity really uh, is that uh elliot's training camp is in a forest so um he has this uh very simple training camp. They go for long runs through the forest and all, all around dirt roads. Uh, they come back, wash from water from a well. You know, it really is quite rudimentary. Um, the training is quite often quite early in the morning, especially the long run. They would go out, you know, at sort of 5.45, 6 o'clock. So before sunrise. Yeah, and, you know, the, the, the very fun thing is to follow them along in the, you know, in the Matatu bus and then watch as the sun comes up and you've got this huge group of runners, uh, many of them world-class, you know, running their 40k long run, that's, you know, that's fabulous to watch. And Shalane, in terms of diets, when they're in the training camp, again, it's pretty basic stuff, but it's all high nutrition. Yeah, it's all high quality ingredients because it's locally sourced from the land right there. They have a diet of milk from local cows. They have beet juice, rice, 
ugali, which is like a maize flour, which is a, a Kenyan staple, and occasional meat. But it's it's just really simple foods. There's not a lot of processed foods, so um, it really allows them to have really great nutrition. And I don't. It's not that they're trying to have great nutrition. It's just naturally the way their culture is. Well, actually, I have to say the the, the beet juice thing. I think that might be a new innovation uh, because I don't remember, you know, from a few years ago, anyone doing that. But there has been some science into in, into the you know the potential of uh, of beet juice. So I wonder whether that's something a little something's been introduced. Just a quick weather update: there was a 10% chance of rain forecast for today, and I can confirm that it has just started to rain now. So if we see one or two splits and spats on the on the camera lens, that is now real rain as they go around the part of Stern again. The, the larger of the two uh, roundabouts at either end of this Hauptallee course, and they are now through 20 kilometres. We'll bring you the latest split as soon as we get it, but 56-52, Shalane, was the target for 20 kilometres, and very shortly we will be through the halfway point. Yeah, I mean... They did not want rain. <laughs> they did not predict rain, but, you know, Elliot is prepared for anything. Um, I don't think that's going to deter him in any way. He probably isn't even recognizing that it's raining. Um, there's some great fans trying to run along the course on the outside there, um, maybe trying to capture a picture or encourage, but I don't think he'll be lasting very long. Oh, there he goes, chanting. What a surprise. He's disappearing off the picture. <laughs> There is Elliot. We've been talking about all sorts of things. And, of course, we shouldn't forget that the man at the heart of this whole day, this whole several months, years of planning, is Elliot Kipchoge. I'm noticing just a small, small gap from him to Matt Centrowitz. And I don't know oh, if it was, you know, him just giving a little space or if he's kind of falling off a little bit. Um, I, it'll be interesting to see. Um, hopefully he tucks right back in there with Matt. So through 20 kilometres, 2.52, so just outside the desired 2.50 pace for a sub two hour marathon. But uh, the green boxes show that those kilometres were within the uh, target. And you can see netting out of all that, we are still nine seconds inside sub two hour pace. 159.59, of course, is the target. Maybe even better than that. And the next milestone, Ed, will be the halfway mark. And a reminder that in Monza two years ago, when he had his first attempt at breaking the sub two-hour marathon, he went through in 59.57. Yeah, so we're looking for anything in the high 59s uh, is good. So let's see. I was I was noticing that gap as well to, to Matt Centrovitz, and I was thinking maybe that's just the turn. You know, sometimes they get a bit strung out, and I don't think we've seen them from the side really on the turn, but it seems to have closed up a little bit. Yeah, he's closed back up to, to Matt Centrowitz. Um, it did have me, have me a little nervous, though, <laughs> just watching him, um, only because, you know, the data shows that drafting can serve about 80% of energy as opposed to being out front and taking the brunt of the win. Ed, some people have uh, criticised or maybe had a, a view about the role of the, of the lead car there. We can see perhaps that that's adding extra protection and, and adding to the, the, the aerodynamic thing. But essentially, as far as the experts have explained to us, the only reason that car is there is to project the laser pacer. Right, so if, so if you look at the aerodynamics, if you talk to Robbie Ketchell, who designed the aerodynamics, he said, if it were up to me, I wouldn't have a car, which, again, is counterintuitive. You'd think a car would help, but you know, what he wants is for these front five guys to be hit with as big an energy flow as possible, and the car doesn't help him do that. So, uh, so yeah, again, it, it doesn't seem like that would be right, <laughs> But all the computational flow dynamics that they've been doing have, have told them that, you know, the, the best results would be without a car. We are now approaching the second half of this challenge. 21 kilometers completed. 21.1, of course, is the exact halfway point. 42 kilometers, 195 meters, or 26.2 miles, if you like your distances uh, in the old Imperial thing. And that's the scene here. It really is atmospheric. The crowd in the Prater, this uh, green, clearing the conkers off the course. Of course, it's early autumn here uh, in Europe, and we are on target and 11 seconds inside the sub two hour marathon pace. Of course, the first part of the race, the first half, is just clicking off the kilometres, really. And uh, as we've seen, and as we say so many times, uh, uh, Shalane, it, it, it's really after 30 kilometres that the real business gets done. Yeah, that's when, that's when the real running begins. Um, 
I was trying to see if there was a half marathon split there yet. I didn't see a split, so but it. We'll try to get that uh, half marathon split, but I believe it was under one hour. But we'll get that to everyone soon. Well, we are 11 seconds inside, and I guess it's it's all about conserving energy and getting that balance right between maybe having some credit in the bank, Shalane, in the first half of the race, so that if things do get a little bit tough in the latter stages, in that last 10K, that he's got somewhere to go. But, but getting that balance right, striking that balance is so, so important. When it's such a finite uh, race, and this is unknown territory, literally no human has tried to attempt this. So it's, there's a lot of unknowns physiologically what Elliot can handle. So we may see some fluctuations here and there. I do see a little bit of strain maybe on his face. He's kind of puffing his cheeks, maybe doing a little smiling. It means he's working hard, um, as it should be. This should be hard. Um, but I can see some signs that I didn't see about 5K ago that he is, he's working. I think he's, he's already working. Yeah, I think he's having a little difficult a little patch. Patch, here. yeah. Well, we saw a couple of weeks ago in, in Berlin an astonishing run by Kenanisa Bekele, who also had a difficult moment in that race. And at one point, he was over 100 metres behind the leader and really struggling. He had, he said, a, a bit of a hamstring problem or a calf problem, but remarkably came through that and stormed to within two seconds of, Ken, of uh, Elliot Kipchoge's world record. Talk us through, Shalane, how you cope with those difficult moments, maybe a stitch or maybe a little tweak or a twin somewhere. You know, it's, it's all about mentally tricking yourself. So, you know, what I've done in races is I'll, I'll try to just say, OK, pick out a lamppost or a tree and get to that point and kind of distract myself from what I'm physically feeling. Um, the last K, I guess, was 2.52 we're getting for um, the 22nd K and the 21st K was 2.48. Um, but yeah, distraction. It's all about mental distraction to take yourself out of the moment in a way. And sometimes I'll refer back to my training back home and my successful moments where I push through the discomfort and the pain. I may look forward to just something as simple as getting to the next fluid station. Um, I'll do all sorts of little tricks to get myself to do through the rough patches. 2.52, Ed, for the last K. Yeah. How high would that figure need to be before you started getting seriously worried? It's just if you saw a few in a, a, few in a row. I think it, it, it's, less the, it's less the number itself than the, the, than the pattern it suggests. So uh, I think he's trying to settle himself down now. I've just been watching him very closely for, for the last couple of minutes. I think he had a rough patch. And I think maybe he's just coming through it. But let's see. The next couple of splits are going to be seriously interesting to watch because that's going to tell us whether you know this is on or not. Yeah. Still maintaining a very, very healthy speed here. 13 miles an hour. Needs to be hitting 13.1, of course, to consistently get to sub two hour pace. 26.2 miles, the full distance in miles. And let's just home in on here on Elliot Kipchoge. This is a great shot for us to see the cadence and the way, the rhythm, the natural rhythm. Shalane, just give us the, the expert view on, on what you're seeing here. I mean, Elliot's legs are perfection. If you just look from the waist down, his heel to butt, that's what I look for, is a nice, nice pickup of the legs. And his heel is coming right up to his butt. He's got nice pop off the road. When, when athletes um, get tired in the marathon, you'll just see that their foot tends to land a little bit heavier and wants to stay on the ground longer. We just got a nice glimpse of them run by so quickly. Um, I feel like he's regrouped. He looks a lot better. His face is showing um, just a lot more relaxation. Ed, the thumbs are out. The thumbs are out. I think that's good news. So uh, he's still brushing lint from his lapels. <laughs> so he's, as far as I can tell, I think he's come through a little rough patch there. Well, that's good news if indeed he has. We're waiting for the uh, six team to get ready. They will take over at 23 kilometers and take them through to uh, 28 kilometers. And there we are, Eric Kiptanui, who's having a busy old morning, who's back on uh, as the team captain. I'll tell you what, that guy's in shape. <laughs> he's having to do a serious workout this morning. He's going to sleep well tonight. OK, so we've got Philip Ingerbritsen, who's uh, back on for his second stint. Uh, Victor Chumo from uh, Kenya. And Paul Chalimo. 
uh, of the USA. Kenyan born, of course. Kenyan born. Uh, Ugandan. Ronald Musala, Musagala. Who's had a fantastic yeah. season on the Diamond League circuit. The, the extremely industrious Eric Kiptanui was the captain here. Uh, and then we've got the Ethiopian uh, Salomon Borrega and, um, and Koic as the other wingman. So they, these guys are now, um, you know, they know their roles. Um, they're working pretty hard, especially the guys who are, you know, who are up for the second time. Um, but for most of these, most of these guys will be the, the last time out. So, you know, you're not going to have to do, uh, uh, I think there's only one guy that's doing three. Yeah. So, so, so if you've done two, you've done, you've done a good stint. Yeah. Well, this is the sixth of uh, nine teams. There are nine rotations, if you like. So, so far, so good out here on the course. Let's go down to uh, Radzi. Radzi's got one of the ardent supporters. We heard of, from him at the top of the programme. Radzi's with Chris Froome. Absolutely. Ardent supporter is the word. Four times Tour de France champion, Olympic medalist as well. Chris, how much are you enjoying watching Elliot do this? It is phenomenal. It is. It is. I mean, it's fantastic. Um, I mean, it's just incredible to watch him. It looks like he's not even breathing. Just He's just gliding over, over, the, over the road. It's just it's amazing to be here and to be part of this, part of this atmosphere. And hopefully we'll be witnessing his, history being made today. And to that point, you're Kenyan-born. What do you think it will mean to the people of Kenya for one of their own to make history? It, it would be incredible. I mean, obviously, Kenya's quite well known already for, for its marathon runners, but to have someone do something as momen momentous as this, monumental as this, sorry, um, it will just be, it, it will be such a, such a boost for, for all, all the athletes uh, over there and basically breaking barriers, showing that, the, the impossible is, is doable and um, especially coming from such uh, humble beginnings I think it would be inspiring a lot of a lot of people around the world Absolutely and, and coming to yourself in terms of your performance when you're say in the Tour de France where is where does your mind go when it gets hard when it hurts just like Elliot I'm sure will be experiencing now I'm sure he will be reaching that point very soon as well um, I mean it's it's this is what he does day in, day out, and it's 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 what you you almost prepare yourself for that hurt, for that for that feeling of, of sort of desperation that you don't have anything else left. So he'll be getting there, but he'll he'll be accepting that uh, and and pushing through it. That's uh, that's that's what it's all about, and I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I, I yeah, uh, I, I'm sure Elliot is probably the most capable human being on earth to, to deal with that. So let's see. He's a special human being. Thanks for your time, Chris. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Chris Room there, of course, four times Tour de France winner and very much part of the, uh, the Ineos family. So much support, of course, not just within athletics, track and field from the running uh, community as well, but outside the sport. We heard from Sir Ben Ainsley at the top of the programme, Patrick Vieira, the uh, former France uh, captain, football captain, all absolutely 100% behind Elliot Kipchoge as well. So we've heard from uh, Chris Froome. Let's go back to uh, hearing from the pacemakers. We heard from, uh, we saw Matt Centrowitz, of course, who was the team captain uh, from Team 5. He's with Crystal. Matt, you know, there's expected to be about 20,000 fans throughout the day just being here for this moment. What was the energy like from them? Oh, amazing. I mean, there is kind of like an indoor track feeling. It's so intimate. Everyone's like on top of you. Um, and they must have been a couple feet away the whole, the whole way, uh, all the way through the course. So it definitely helped carry you to, uh, through each leg for sure. The 18 to 23 kilometer leg, what was most important from that leg for you as a captain? You know, I think that we just kind of stay within um, the 250 kilometer pace that we're trying to run. Um, it's so exciting out there. The energy is just through the roof. It's kind of easy to start one step in the, the green line and get a little excited out there. But um, we're in the middle of the race and we just want Kipchoge to feel as smooth and as easy as possible at this stage. Matt, you're part of history, basically. How does that feel? I mean, I still don't think it's set in yet, just kind of how honored I am to be here, be a part of this. Um, I, I was just telling you earlier, throughout that whole five kilometers, I was just thinking, like, how, how much of an honor it is to be one step in front of Kipchoge, trying to take him through this world record uh, attempt. So. But there's a, a real side to it. So how are you feeling, actually? You come from Worlds, you're here, the physical aspects of it, just for that one leg. I think I was hoping to just feel a little bit better out there, but... Um, I, I was able to do my job, stay relaxed, and uh, again, I can't just believe how he's running eight plus of these. It's just an incredible human being, 
um, a once in a generation athlete and uh, I'm just honored to be a part of it. Before we let you go, just one, one question about the challenges out there. Are there any challenges that we might no, not see? And did you feel any rain? As, as a team captain, um, our biggest challenge was making sure we stayed within a line um, on those roundabouts. And uh, so we can make sure he runs the, the accurate 26.2. So the other guys in front of me and behind us were allowed to go outside those lines, but we had to stay inside of it. Um, and then the second, um, I think, just kind of difficult thing out there that you might not um, see on the camera is just how loud it is. So. We were supposed to communicate with each other, let you know, slow down, pick it up, stay together, pack it up. When we're doing the exchanges, like captain in, captain out, and it's extremely hard to hear out there, even when you're like two, three feet away from someone. So um, you might have to tap a guy on the shoulder or uh, kind of bump him out of the way if you're, if you're trying to um, make any kind of movement out there. But um, other than that, it's been, uh, it's great. Matt, thanks for your time. Enjoy your cool down. I appreciate it. Thanks. Matt Centrowitz there, having done a, a terrific job, and you've got the sense there of the pride and the honour that he feels in being part of this, what we hope will be an historic day. Lots of chatting, just uh, left of picture there, just out of picture is uh, Valentine Trell, the athlete's manager there, handing now more drinks and more gels to Elliot if he wants them, and he does take something on board there. Communication, uh, Shalane, so, so important uh, throughout this process. Yeah, I mean, he has such a tight-knit team. He has worked with the same coach um, throughout his career. Patrick Sang has been by his side. He also has had the same massage therapist th since 2002. Elliot is just a very loyal man, and he likes to build a team of people he can really trust around him. We've talked a lot today, Ed, about his physical prowess. We've talked about him as a person. There is no doubting his physical shape and, and, and what a naturally talented athlete he is. What about his mental state? Because as far as we know, he doesn't actually have a formal mental coach. No, he, uh, I mean, he's very much his own coach, but you see how strong he is when he gets really challenged in races. You saw it in the London Marathon this year. He was really, really challenged by some very strong Ethiopian athletes. And you could see his uh, strength of, of mind there in burning them off. Uh, you know, he does read a lot. So he likes, you know, Paolo Coelho, you know, he likes to read self-help books. You know, he's, there are lots of kind of business style, you know, management books in, the, in that camp. They do a lot of reading, those guys, when they're not watching Premiership football and so on. But, the, you know, they, they really try to, they really try to uh, improve themselves in that regard. Yeah, he actually has in his home uh, with his family a library full of books. And a few of the books that he's uh, recommended I've actually read because I said if Elliot, if it th Elliot thinks it helps him, I'm, I'm going to read it too. And um, so, yeah, he's, he's a great um, source of inspiration for many people um, in the fact that he's, he educates himself and he's always self-improving. In fact, Patrick Sang, his coach, says, I think we're at the point in my career where I actually learn more from Elliot than I teach him. Interesting here, just a, a final briefing for the next team of pacemakers who will take over at uh, 28 kilometers. Uh, going through final instructions, there is Tony Barden, who is uh, part of the, uh, the London Marathon team. That is metronomic pacemaking, 250s all across the board. Yeah, that was beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, so you want to talk about continuity as well. Um, Elliot's mum taught Patrick Sang at primary school. So this, you know, this line continues, you know, they're from the same village, they're from the same little subset, the Nandi called the Talai, you know, he has that real connection to his home through his sport. And we should say as well that Elliot had not just a, a very basic and very humble start in life, he lost his father when he was very, very young indeed, and effectively was, was brought up and raised by his mum as a, as a single parent, you know, the youngest of four children. It was tough. You know, here's a guy who, like so many East Africans we've heard over the years, who used to run to school a couple of miles uh, in the morning, back for lunch, back in the afternoon, back again, used to cycle to the local market, the nearest town, to take the milk from the farm to get it sold. Th th this was a, a hard start in life. Yeah, I don't think he would actually make too much of that um, because of the type of person that he is. Um, but yeah, these guys, uh, you know, who, who lead the world in distance running from Kenya, a lot of them come from subsistence farming backgrounds, and a lot of them have a very rough start in life. And, you know, I think uh, Haile once said to me, you think you can be a good runner from a, a good family? You know, he, he felt like that kind of background fertilized your talent. 
you know, rather than being a, a hindrance. He felt like it was important for a runner to somehow, you know, to have some challenges to overcome in their early life. Yeah, I believe it's there's a callousing and, you know, probably because of his upbringing, he looks at running as a joy. It doesn't seem like a chore to him. He's had and experienced harder things in life, so running 26.2 miles is, is not so challenging when you've been through other things. And his mantra, very simply, hard work, humility and discipline, and the, the routine that we have tried to bring across to you that Ed was describing is very much a, a monastic lifestyle, isn't it, Ed? It's very much run, eat, sleep and repeat and repeat again and repeat again. Yeah, he just keeps on doing the same thing. There's no magic. There really is no like silver bullet to getting as fast and as fit. I, I mean, you have to have the talent, but yes. you know, you have to keep on doing the same things. That's the mantra for all marathoners: run, eat, sleep, repeat. And that's what really breeds and produces the best results if you want to be a great marathoner and a great distance runner. I think there was a slight trip I, there. I was there a that. trip? Yes, <laughs> I just saw Elliot kind of a little trip up in that transition. And so they've lost their a little rocky yeah, yeah that, that wasn't that was a little bit ragged you have to say that the transitions from one team to the next they're just coming through in front of our commentary position yet again from left to right as we look out from our commentary position here and once again the speed quite breathtaking and I can't stress enough the crowd out on the course is absolutely phenomenal and let's once again Shalane contrast that to the experiment in Monza where there was no crowd at all it was special invitees only and there was simply no atmosphere yeah there was only atmosphere on the final straightaway um, and the back side of the track there was no one I mean you could literally hear crickets you could hear breathing you could hear your feet on the road I think we've all know that Elliot thrives off of an environment and the support and the fans cheering. He said when he uh, broke the world record in Berlin that when he was running alone the last, you know, 17K, that it really was the fans cheering um, that was music to his ears and that was, helped him break that record. So this is an essential, if we're talking about baking our cake, an essential ingredient to his success today because I'm nervous right now because I know what the last 40 minutes of a marathon is going to feel like. Each 10-minute chunk is going to get harder and harder, and he's going to start relying on the environment around him. We're now into Team 7 there. There is the lineup for Team 7 with uh, Brett Robinson, the Australian, the latest captain to take over. We've got uh, Jakob Ingebrigtsen as well, fresh from the World Championships in Doha. We have Stuart McSwain as well. And again, an international feel in this pacemaking team. 41 in total, six reserves, five teams of seven, and they are doing a sterling job, apart from perhaps that one transition we saw where there was a slight trip uh, of Elliot Kipchoge, which would certainly not have been in the planning and in the preparation for this, but he seems to have recovered uh, very well. We've got 15 Kenyans, seven Americans, six Ugandans. We've got Australians, Norwegians, Ethiopians, and one Japanese pacemaker. It really is a truly international feel. One hour 20 in, let's go back to our, our little cake metaphor. Uh, it's in the oven, it's been in the oven for an hour and 20. How's it looking, how's the cooking going? Well, I got nervous there for a little bit when Elliot started to look like he was falling off pace from Matt Centrowitz and we were in the roundabout section and I felt like I saw some strain on his face so I was definitely a little nervous but I feel like he's regrouped, he's regained his composure. I feel like every time he gets, you know, 10 minutes further into the race, he's going to start to build some adrenaline and start to get excited. It's going to hurt. He's going to have to lean into it. But I feel like he's setting himself up for some history right now. Well, Jakob Ingebrigtsen is one, of course, of the three Ingebrigtsen brothers, this extraordinary dynasty of runners from Norway. Let's catch up with uh, one of his brothers. Philip Ingebrigtsen is with Crystal. Philip, I mean, you, you tried to double in Doha at the World Champs, but you doubled here today. What was it like across both legs? Uh, it was a bit easier to, to do the double here, but uh, it was really fun. Uh, we've been practicing the last couple of days and uh, tried to give uh, some messages and try to talk to each other during, uh, uh, during the race, but... Uh, the crowd is so loud that you couldn't hear anything. So you just had to trust your teammates and uh, and uh, help keep Jogi as uh, as good as we could. And uh, I think it was smooth. So it was uh, it was it was fun to experience the pace and and uh, get a feeling of uh, what goes into breaking to a two-hour marathon. It's uh, it's an incredible feat if you can do it. So 
it's fast. <laughs> Let's talk about the pace. I mean, fairly even splits. What of the consistency when it comes to Elliot? Yeah, I think that's the that's the way to go here. Uh, to do uh, to go out hard, but, uh, but to be, uh, be able to maintain the pace. And uh, if you're strong uh, in the finish, you can go even faster. But uh, it's it's a it's a thin line between. Uh, uh, an incredible race and and, uh, and uh, like hitting the wall. So he, he needs to stay right at the sweet spot and uh, and uh, that's the thing he was, he's been practicing for many years. He's an experienced runner and uh, and uh, hopefully he can pull it together today. Philip, how will this impact you as an athlete in your own career? I was thinking about it while running. Uh, it's uh, the main motivation behind like my running is. is to see how, how fast it can be for uh, different uh, disciplines, like this, different uh, events. So uh, right now it's the 1500 and uh, maybe in a couple of years uh, my main focus will be the 5k and who knows, in 15 years uh, it will be the marathon. So it's, uh, it's cool to try road races and, and get a feeling of uh, like the audience, like the crowd is really close. So that's, that's really fun. Well, now your hard work is done. You can sit back and relax like the rest of us and wait for that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be exciting and hopefully we can do it. I, after Doha, the, my season was done. So this is my holiday. And I'm here uh, running. So I almost like running a lot. <laughs> Good life choices. Thanks, Philip. Thanks. Philip Ingebrigtsen there, sounding and looking good as... Uh, Crystal was saying his job is done. Now then, we saw just a few minutes ago the last splits for the last few K, 250s all the way round. And, Shalane, you've been looking at the positioning on the on the road, on the Hautale of Elliot Kipchoge, and signs that actually he's feeling much better. Yeah, so as an athlete, when I'm getting antsy and I want to run faster, I will run up on the edge in the shoulder of my pacer. And it looks like he was running up on the edge of uh, Brett Robinson there, um, not running directly drafting behind him. Instead, he's on the shoulder, which to me means he's kind of like, pushing and that last K is actually showcasing it is a little faster they ran a 248 last K so two seconds faster than projected I was just wondering about this you know sometimes he's off on one side uh, and I wonder whether that's to do with what they've been told about where the what little wind there is where it's coming from so now we see what's kind of 12 seconds inside uh, target time and that's the highest it's been in the race so far yeah projected one 159.47 but isn't it amazing how much better he looks now than he did yes. 15 minutes ago we can yes. only speculate we don't know how he was feeling if he did go through a, a bit of a moment Shalane what might that have been you know it could be something as simple as just his drink not settling well in his stomach and um, you know I've had circumstances in which um, the fluids are kind of coming up they're not settling well in the stomach and it could be something as simple as that um, it seemed really early on to see him kind of straining, so uh, I'm guessing it was maybe a fluid issue. This is the quickest they've been running at any stage during the whole challenge, 13.3 miles an hour. And this side-on shot, let's just go to this again, because we see in all its glory, Shalane, the, the cadence and the natural running style of Elliot Kipchoge. He's, he's just like, but he does, he stands out to me. He just has the absolutely efficient, perfect form for a marathoner. You see the, the top half of his body, it's like a rifle target, you know? He, he stays so still and his legs are doing this work and then, you know. And his core is so strong and straight, all momentum. If you see, they're running ahead of the green line, it seems. So it seems like they're, um, they're feeling good. This is a, a critical moment coming up. They're approaching the 30 kilometer mark and uh, the time we're looking out for here is 125.18. They're comfortably inside that at the moment. 125.18, so in about 16 seconds time, would be sub to uh, our mouth and pace. And in Monza, he went through in 125.20. <laughs> More fans, it's the same guy again. He's having his moment in the sun there, in the gray on the left of picture. He wants to be a part of history today and who can blame him? We all do. We're hoping that Elliot Kipchoge will be making history today. 30 kilometers have been completed. And let's just go back to Monza, just as a little guide, because in Monza, he was two sec seconds outside of sub two hour marathon pace. Yeah, he's, he's doing fantastically well. I, I saw a little grimace there, so, uh, you know, obviously it's hurting. It would hurt <laughs> doing this. Be expected. 12K to go then. This is where the 
critical stage of the race starts. If we were in normal marathon conditions and this was a race with lots of other competitors, they often say that the racing starts at 30 kilometers. Normally, somebody takes the handbrake off at 30 K. Yeah, that is uh, traditionally when I've been in major championships, it's 30 K gloves are thrown down to the road, hats are off. Now, it, now it's the real fighting begins. And you know, Elliot doesn't have um, competitors to, to be fighting against, um, but his, his race is against the clock today in a race towards history. He has to be thinking right now, and I'm sure this is a version of what he's thinking. If not now, when? Right, this is my last chance. I've run, <laughs> I've run 30 kilometers, you know, 12 to go. Like, what other opportunities are you looking for? You know, this is my shot. So he, I think he has to somehow get himself in that uh, frame of mind, which I'm sure he does. Have both of you in, in your own mind got no doubt that if he's not successful today, God forbid, that he wouldn't come back and have another go? I think this is it. I, I believe this is it. I think he's putting everything he has into this moment. And I think it, that kind of pressure actually will bode well because he's going to, like you said, today's the day, I'm going to do it. There's no other opportunity there's no second chances i've done all this work everyone's done all this work now it's time to execute so why not now why not me today and if he does do it that's another thing ticked off he will go into history it will be his neil armstrong moment and we hope that in the next what just over half an hour we can bring him home to do exactly that where then from there? Does Tokyo feature for next year? For Absolutely. The so Abebe Bakila, who was the first black African to win a gold medal, uh, won the marathon in 1960 and in 1964 doubled. Elliot wants to do that. So he won in uh, Rio. He wants to win in Tokyo. You know, so if he had the, it, let's just say he does this and he does the, you know, the Olympic double, that would really make him unassailable, I think. We've just detected perhaps the, the slightest smile stroke grimace on the face of Elliot Kipchoge. He's just uh, behind Jakob Inge Britsum at the moment, and we were mentioning earlier on in commentary that when the smile appears, Shalane, that normally suggests that he's hurting. Yeah, that's the classic Elliot. When he um, is leaning into that hurt, he uses it as a way to manage the pain and to distract himself. But, yep, there we go. I just saw a smile. Um, if I were a competitor and I saw someone smiling, um, I would be very intimidated. Ed, though, you think that part of the, the, the grimace and the smile is actually to try and counterintuitively relax himself, relax the shoulders. I think he's talked about it. He talked about it after Monza. He said, I've, you know, I smile when it's hurting. And that's, you know, it's, a, it's something that if you try, it sounds goofy when you, when you try it when you're running. But I think it actually does work. Like if you make I mean, yourself smart. I believe Elliot. He's, he, <laughs> he's the world record holder. If he says it works, um, you're going to see a lot more people out in uh, road races um, across the world smiling, maybe. Do you know what? I just hope that, uh, yeah, I hope that they, he, can, he can maintain that, that rhythm because he does look very good still. Yeah, physically, everything else is clicking. Like I said, his feet are popping off the ground. They're like little uh, sewing needle, up and down, up and down, up and down. You see how he's off to one side again a little bit here, and you wonder. Yeah, sometimes, um, you know, another tactic that I've also seen is when athletes are hurting, they, they tend to shift around the road. It's like they're uncomfortable, and they're trying to find a comfortable spot. Um, sometimes... If there's, you know, the athlete in front of you, the back kick is maybe just coming up a little too close, so he just wants to run off the, the side. Approaching one hour 30, one and a half hours, about to click round on the clock. We are into the final quarter of this race. We have just under 30 minutes to try and get Elliot Kipchoge into the history books here in Vienna on this extraordinary Saturday morning. Wow. Take us into the mind, Ed, of, of what he must be thinking now. I have absolutely no idea. What, what, <laughs> what, what might he be thinking? Goodness me. Don't, don't, you, you? don't you wish that there were, like, thought bubbles? I've yeah, thought exactly. this forever. I wish we could get into the mindset of the athletes. I wish there were thought bubbles that would pop up. You know, I find that in this stage of the race, I have a mix of emotions. One minute, I'm thinking, this is terrible, it's not going to go well. And then the next minute, I'm thinking, I've got this, I'm a rock star, I can do anything. So it's really, I think, in these moments, kind of fluctuating back yeah. and forth. There's the, I think, you know, he is um, he's someone who is, you know, a, quite a relaxed and zen-like person. 
you don't have any... He's we putting himself through something really, really Excuse extraordinary me. here. And he will be emotional. There is, you know, thoughts bubble up. Thoughts that, you know, you think you suppressed and bad demons sit on one shoulder and good demons, you know, good angels yeah. sit on the other, so... I can tell you, he has practiced this in his mind over and over the last three months. As soon as he committed to this proposition and to this challenge, in training, he has visualized these tough moments and he's pushed through in training and said, imagine you're on the streets of Vienna. This is the crucial moment. This is when you have to execute and push through the pain. So he has practiced this over and over. And I find that actually when I'm in races in a major marathon, I take myself out of the streets of that major city and I go back to the streets of Portland, wherever I'm training, and I visualize myself back in my training grounds, in my comfort zone, with my teammates, with my coach, and it brings this familiarity and it doesn't become this overwhelming proposition. You know, he just had a little conversation with Valentine Trial, his, uh, his manager. That tells you something in itself. Yeah. He just had a little back and forth. If he was really, really hurting badly, I think that would be impossible, so. We are still 10 seconds inside the target. A couple of 252s there, just to break up the uh, the green boxes again if you're just joining us the the green box that we've been showing you kilometer by kilometer means that he is on target for that kilometer two minutes 50 for the kilometer is the target pace that we need and that is represented by that green laser that is sub to our marathon pace and that is the guide which is provided by the the laser pacer car here's the green laser is again the runners go in front of our commentary position there won't be many more times we see them pass and flash in front of our commentary position before the now and the end of the race we're into the last half an hour and the next team here we go the next team this is team number eight eric kiptenui is back in action once again and we will see brett robinson peel away and this is the penultimate team shalane who have got duties between 33 and 38 kilometers you know that this is a team that's going to really need to uh to rally uh, Elliot if he's hurting. I think there's going to be some communicating, them rallying him, talking to him, if he can hear it through the crowd. But, you know, these pacemakers are so intent on helping him and doing whatever they can. Yeah, you see, he actually gets a little lift when he gets a new team. So you sometimes see just a couple of seconds come off the split when he gets a new team. And that's all. So I think Chogate is uh, one of that team, one of his lifelong friends, one of his closest friends. Yeah, and you could actually saw Augustine, I think, just saying a couple of words um, to him. So I don't know whether Elliot heard it, but uh, just when they had a changeover, you saw, you saw him saying something there. And Augustine will be here for the remainder of the race. Um, he is uh, closing out with Elliot, and I, I feel like that's by design. Well, this is all about Elliot Kipchoge, of course, and what a moment we've talk, been talking about what might be going through his mind. One of the things he might be thinking about is his wife and family. Grace, his wife, who has never seen him race live in the flesh before. Well, she is now, and she's with Radzi. She is indeed. Grace, I see you watching your husband up on the screen. What goes through your head when you see him run? Uh, I'm kind of nervous, but I'm also excited that... Uh, he has tried to break the uh, two-hour barrier of marathon. I'm really excited. I'm happy for him. Yeah. You've also brought your three children along as well. How are they enjoying it? They are very excited. They have never been to a race where they are that runs. Yeah, they are, it's their first time. Yeah. So it's a special occasion for all five of you. But what would it mean, do you think, for Kenya? if Elliot were to break this two-hour barrier? Well, Kenyans are really waiting and are very excited for Elliot to do what no human has ever done. Yeah, they are really waiting. <laughs> well, it's an absolute joy talking to you. I won't let, take your eyes off the screen any longer because I know you want to get out there and support your husband. I do have to also say that Grace wouldn't normally do things in front of the camera, so we're very grateful that you've come to speak to us now. Thank, Thank you. you, Grace. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much indeed, Grace. Great to see her here. What a moment and what pride she must be feeling. And uh, Radzi mentioned her three children and uh, Elliot's three children, Lynn, Griffin and Jordan. They're all uh, uh, here today as well. The ignition keys 
of his life, as Elliot refers to them. It's a lovely image and uh, one of several memorable lines. We talked about the self-help books that he, he likes to, uh, to read. He devours them. And actually, in all seriousness, it would be very easy for some of these lines to sound rather cheesy and rather manufactured. But when they come out of the mouth of Elliot Kipchoge, they sound sincere, and he always measures the importance of each word very carefully. Yeah, he is very selective in his words. And as a way, in a way, it's like he, prophetic, the way he delivers them, and he doesn't waste any words. And I think everyone really appreciates what comes out of his mouth because it holds such importance every time he talks. We are into the penultimate team of pacemakers, one man who's done a sterling job today, Stanley Kabeni from Kenya. He was part of Team 7, and he's is with Crystal. Stanley, so great to grab you right here at a crucial part in this race. Can you just give us a sense of, before it all started, what was the camaraderie like? What was it like in the tent? It was really emotional. Uh, we look at Elliot eyes in the tent on the screen and you look at the man he's very straightforward you know he's just in his mind you can tell that he's saying yeah I'm gonna make history today and he's happy that you know all of these people are all over here to witness the history and the rest of the world. Goosebump moment it definitely sounds like but Stanley from a, an African perspective and what this means for the continent of Africa if it is attained. This means a lot not only the continent of Africa but the world at large. Uh, Elliot will be the first human to run uh, under two hours and this is so inspiring not only to the runners all over the world but to everybody that no human is limited you can go to your goals as much as you have that energy and that strong mind that you want to do whatever you want to do so it's not about running it's about inspiring the world and everybody else in the world that everything is possible and no, nothing is limited for you you're sounding confident I sound confident and I, um, I feel confident that this will happen today. I believe in LU 100%. I believe in the team that we have. I believe in uh, the sponsor that, you know, sponsored these Ineos. We, we really believe in what's happening over here because we've been here for a long time just getting ready for this. What of the tradition of distance running in Africa, how it gave you your base and gives Elliot his? Uh, in Africa, running started to be something that's not only sport, but it's everything in our lives. Um, we, do, we do it for sport, but again, we do it for living. Um, running has handed me a scholarship. I went to the United States to study in the University of Arkansas, uh, got my degree, and uh, I was happy because I would have never been able to pay for my school fees. School fees in the United States is about $50,000 a year, so I couldn't afford that, but they gave me free education through my running, and now I'm still going professional with Nike. So it's been quite a journey. But a very incredible journey. I love it. Thank you for being part of this journey. Great chatting to you, Stanley. Appreciate it. Thank you. Stanley Cabeni there as they uh, go around the uh, Lust House. One more time. That's the smaller of the two roundabouts. We are approaching 35 kilometers. We've got, what, just over 20 minutes of running to get Elliot Kipchoge home over the finish line inside the two-hour mark, just to stress, this has never been done before. No, it won't be a world record, but the whole point of this exercise, if you're just joining us, was not to break world records. He's already got the world record. This was stretching the limits. What is the limit of human endeavor? And as the hashtag we've been using said, and as Elliot said so eloquently, uh, no human is limited. He wants to do something that has never been done before. We've had a man on the mood. We've had Roger Bannister breaking the four-minute mile 65 years Years ago we've had uh, Edmund Hillary on Everest all those years ago this would be along the same lines this would be an achievement of that magnitude no human is limited and we are now Ed into the last 20 minutes of this being a, a reality I'm just watching his face here and it is absolutely fascinating his eyes are like dinner plates he's having to talk himself through this he is telling himself that he's got it you know he's smiling a lot it is like um, it's like a man who's told himself to dismiss what his body is telling him. Yeah. His body is saying, stop. He's a man possessed. <laughs> but, you know, he's trying to become a pioneer and a trailblazer right now. And it's a threshold so bold and inconceivable. Yet here we stand at the doorstep with the notion that the human spirit can take us across it. And I believe that in Monza, 
him knowing that he was only 26 seconds away from breaking the barrier, that gave him confidence to then go attack the world record in Berlin, where he ran 201.39. And those two performances, I think, are is what catapulting him forward today and making him have so much self-belief that he's convinced almost everyone else in the world that he can do it too. Um, and I think this is a huge moment. Your whole career for 20 minutes. Absolutely right. It's right here. Here are the final team of pacemakers, team number nine. They will take them home from 38 kilometers right through to the finish. And the captain, of course, he was the captain in the first team. It's Bernard Legat. And how fitting that uh, the 44-year-old, the oldest pacemaker in the team, the most experienced and a dear, dear friend of Elliot, should be the captain on the final leg. Bernard and Elliot have actually raced each other a number of times. And um, the experience the two of them have. They may not be the youngest um, athletes out on the road, but their experience is what it makes the difference. Wow, I think we just need to take a, a pause, don't we, and just breathe. I've just edged myself up closer on my seat. The butterflies are really starting to accumulate right now. And we are on the finish line here. We're hoping to, to call Elliot home and make a little bit of history here. I can tell you that the crowds at the finish line are 12, 15, 20 deep. We have a posse of Kenyans who are making an absolute racket. We've got Kenyan flags all over the place. The atmosphere is absolutely electric. And, and yet again, one of the contrasts between the the experience in Monza a couple of years ago, and I think you make the point very well, uh, Shalane, that mentally describing that he knows in his heart of hearts that he can do this. Yeah, he knows that this is going to open up the floodgates of the future as to what is possible. And, you know, you can't, sometimes you can't be what you can't see. So he's going to be an example for all future athletes, but not just athletes, his messages to the world of, you know, what are you possible, you know, what is your, what are you capable of doing and what is your possible best self? I feel very nervous right now because anyone who's ever run a marathon will know that the last few miles, uh, anything can happen and the wheels can come off. He looks really good. He's hurting. You know, you just, you're just hoping that he's got this. 10 seconds is the margin for error here. I just wonder as we're, what, six kilometers from the end here, both of you, once he gets into that final kilometre, once he can physically see the finish line with his naked eye, could you argue that actually it's the next couple or two or three kilometres that are the most crucial? Yeah, I believe the next... Oh, my gosh, look at the fans. That's incredible. I believe that the next few Ks are uh, really crucial because once you can see the finish line and taste it, it's like a... They, they say like a horse running to the barn, um, you know, and it'll, I'll, be, I'll be curious to see as to whether the Pacers are going to stay on to the very end. Um, when will they peel off? If, you know, if he's feeling good enough, is he going to communicate that? Um, I'm really curious to see how it unravels in the last uh, K. Yes, in Monza, you may remember, if you were watching that two years ago, the pacemakers peeled away at 42 kilometers to give the, the full streets and the full final couple of hundred meters to Elliot alone. We've got two or three different scenarios that have been painstakingly put together, depending and rehearsed endlessly and repeated so that nothing has been less to chance. And so it depends very much on where we are against the clock as the final team take over at 38 kilometers, led by Captain Legat. There he is, itching to go. Bernard Legat, a five-time Olympian, 44 years old, 13 world and Olympic medals to his name and he is going to slot into place and Shalane try and bring Elliot home. This is the moment when you're in a track race and you go ding, 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 last lap. This is what we're going into. That was the ding, 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 the last lap. You know, Elliot said last night, I don't know where the limits are, but I'd like to go there. Well, the sound is deafening here. I hope you're getting a sense of that from our wonderful pictures back home. There we are. We've got fans from all over the world. Remember, a lot of people have traveled from Kenya to be here, the 8,500 kilometers. We bumped into some people from Utah yesterday. They'd made the trip. They'd flown overnight, and they were there, just so excited to be here. Yes, we bumped into so many amazing fans yesterday, but specifically a family from Utah that flew all the way here. Um, it was a mother and two sons. And I said, you know, why are you here? And they said, we love Elliot. We love marathoning. And we are here to support Elliot. There are two things going through my mind right now, which are, firstly, we should enjoy just watching this guy run because we're not going to get maybe too many more chances to see him like this. And the second of all is, I hope that he's enjoying it. 
you know, even though he's in this tumult of exertion, even though he must be hurting so much, you really hope that he's soaking this in in some way. The next 15 minutes of this man's life, and indeed the pacemakers as well, but particularly Elliot Kipchoge, could be life-defining, and that is not overstating it. This is going to be, if he does it, an achievement off the scale. It's never been done before, and I think it transcends running, sport, and it really, truly pushes the boundaries as we've never seen before. I think, you know, the, the sport of marathon running uh, is watched by not that many people. If he does this, everyone will know one marathon runner at least. You know, they'll know the guy that broke two hours of the marathon. And they'll, they'll know him as Elliot, yes. Oh, wow. And it's metronomic again, isn't it? The pacemakers have done an absolutely outstanding job. From memory, correct me, both of you, if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've had a kilometre outside 252. I think that's the slowest we've had. Correct. Um, 52 has been the slowest. And we've had a, a 248 as the quickest. Yeah, so they've been really w within a tiny window. I mean, we've been That's incredible. If you yeah. really think about it, that is incredible pacing. Yeah, and the position on the, on the road as well, just to remind you, they have to stay within those dotted orange lines. Up. Certainly, Elliot does as well. We've got the laser, the green laser, which is giving them the exact pace, and they've been bang on the money. And to do all of that whilst running in excess of 13 miles an hour for as long as they've been running is truly sensational. Yeah, you see, this is the work, you see, that the whole team have done. So they've been right on pace all the way through, but they've, but they've you know, they've had this system where they, which they've adhered to, which is this, you know, the lasers and the formation, and it's, it's worked a treat. Wherever you're watching in the world, whatever your time zone, whether it's morning, afternoon or evening or the middle of the night, we hope you're enjoying. We're on the verge of history here, folks. We cannot overstate this. And Valentin Trau, the athlete manager, is there still on his bicycle. We've got and Hugh smiling. Jones just and smiling as smiling. well. smiling, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hugh Jones there, who's a former London Marathon winner and uh, a course measurer for marathons all over the world. He's also on his bicycle there enjoying the ride. I think people think this is, uh, this is going to happen now. You can see from the support team, there's still a little bit of nervousness on Valentine's face, but you can see from the, the support team that they think this is going to happen. Well, let's hear from one of the fantastic pacemakers who've done their job. Patrick Tiernan was part of the, the last team that were out there, and he's been speaking to Crystal. Patrick, we are on the threshold. Yeah, I mean, it's unreal. I mean, he's on pace and he's killing it, so we're also rooting for him here. What does the no human is limited motto of this whole challenge mean to you? I mean, I mean, he's a, he's a human who lives by that motto. I mean, two years, I mean, five years ago, the sub two hour marathon wasn't even considered possible. Um, and now you've got a guy who's out here and he's cruising around looking like he's not even breathing doing it. So, you know, the motto is it's perfectly suited for this event. And, you know, it's something that we all, all 40 of us want to try and strive for once we, once we get out of here. And he's going to do it? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll knock on wood, but yeah, no, he's looking great. I mean, we're, he's cruising through it, so, yeah. Thanks for chatting to us, Patrick. Let's keep our eyes set. Patrick there, Patrick Tiernan, and we've got on the finish line here, we've got people who've climbed into trees. We've got one or two people who are standing on top of the porta the portable toilets, would you believe it? Everybody is craning their necks. Everybody wants the best possible view here on the Hauptallee. We're standing by for major sporting history here. And, Ed, we're into the last 10 minutes. We've got 10 minutes to bring him home. Well, I'm starting to feel like those uh, men in bowler hats who watch Roger Bannister, you know, they had that privilege of watching that great moment at Ifley Road. And if everything goes well for the next 10 minutes, and I'm touching some wood here, uh, I think this is... This looks now like it's going to happen. You know, you'd have to drop, you'd have to drop quite a lot of pace over these few Ks to to lose it from here. It can happen, but uh, you can see there's more relaxation on the faces of the people around Elliot, and you can see on his face he's still looking pretty relaxed. I mean, I'm sure he's hurting, but he looks quite good. Yeah, I'm sure he's realizing he has nine minutes of running, and you know, you tell yourself, I can do anything for nine minutes. Um, right in front of us, we are watching as all the pacers gather on the other side of the road to cheer on Elliot, and I believe there'll be uh, hopefully something to celebrate here soon.
Julian Wanders is, uh, you know, sensibly put on a huge puffer jacket because he's freezing cold. They're all jumping around. They're taking selfies. Um, the whole team are now assembling because they think it's going to happen. Well, I don't know about you guys, but my heart, I can feel it pounding in my shirt this morning. And we are just sitting here watching and in anticipation, licking our lips here. 150 on the clock. And we have, what, exactly nine minutes to bring him home. What an opportunity here. And these final pacemakers with Bernard Lagat. I think it's so, so fitting that Bernard Lagat is the team captain for this final leg. Yeah, from the same area where Elliot grew up, friends forever, um, you know, was a part of the last attempt. You know, the, the camaraderie on that last attempt was massive, uh, even though, you know, he just missed the two hours. Um, I think it's, I think it's a, a gorgeous thing that Bernard Lagat's in this final group. Well, 40 kilometres will be the last major K kilometre to, to reach the last landmark, and that will be 153.44 is the target. Uh, and let's just remind ourselves that actually by this stage in Monza, he was already starting to struggle, and he was already pretty... Well, he already knew that he was not going to achieve what he wanted to achieve. He's in much better shape today. You can tell... Um Physically, you can just tell in the cadence of his running. You can tell by the support staff and a few smiles that are breaking through. I feel like the Pacers feel like they know it's going to happen. Um, he's in a much better place today than he was in Monza two years ago. We were at 10 seconds inside. We've just dipped to nine. I don't want to worry you folks at home, but we just need to keep an eye on that clock because we are ticking ever closer. But the cadence looks good, doesn't it? The shoulders look relaxed. Yeah, but you see the thumbs have gone in. <laughs> he's not feeling as good. Uh, he hasn't got very far to go. I mean, he has every right not to feel good. I wouldn't feel good. Um, but he still looks amazing, all things considering. And, you know, in Monza, when it started to drift, he couldn't pull it back, and who could? You know, once, the, once those splits start to drift, you, you know, you're finished. In it's terms almost of like attempt. you have a rope tied to these pacers, and once that rope is broken, it is so hard to get back on the path. And um, the fact is, he's not allowing the rope to swing too, too far off of his pacer so the rope is not broken he's attached to this pack and he's going to just enjoy the ride to the finish communication still taking place between valentine on the left of picture there on the bicycle he's giving instructions out we just saw elliot just lift his shirt momentarily just to uh, to wipe his nose he needs to make sure everything is absolutely on point let's just enjoy these pictures i think ed has said let's just enjoy history unfolding here before our very eyes Well, we've had seven successive 250s, two minutes 50 for a kilometre. And anybody who's thinking about going out for their Saturday run, Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, maybe even doing a park run of five kilometres, well, just watch and learn. This is the master at work here. Just over two kilometres to go. This is something that everyone can understand. It's a neat number. It's uh, this unbroken barrier, you know, many times when you watch a race, oh, look at those splits, they're so even. Many times when you watch a race, it's not immediately obvious what's happening. In this, you know what's happening. This guy has to run under two hours, and it looks like he's, he's bang on track to do that. El Elliot just took his last swig of a water bottle, and no, so he didn't really drink much, but there's this... Uh, it's been proven in science that just swishing the fluids around in your mouth gives you a surge of energy and as if, like, you're just consuming much. But he didn't really drink that much, but that was his last water bottle, I assume. Well, they are comfortably on the last lap here, the last loop of this 9.6-kilometre uh, loop, and uh, he's smiling again. Now, people can smile for different reasons, mostly because they're happy. We've said that Elliot often smiles when it's really hurting. At what point does that smile, Shalane, become a realization that he's going to do this? <laughs> um, I would only assume is when the finish line is in sight. That's the only reason to smile, because the marathon is an unknown beast, and you never know, you can never get too confident. So even though he may be feeling good or not so good, you just you can never swing an emotion too strongly either way. But usually the smiling right now, I think, is because he's hurting, but hopefully there'll be a mixed uh, smile of uh, pain and pleasure at the finish. Just over four minutes to go, and the pacemakers, we are expecting to peel off and let him have the, the Hauptallee to himself to enjoy the moment 
an historic moment as we click ever closer to the magic figure of 159.59. As things stand, he will be comfortably inside two hours. Ed, how are you feeling from here? I feel like a bundle of nerves. Who thought they were going to see this in 2019? We haven't seen it yet, but who thought that this was possible in 2019? Yes, there are some, you know, parts of this which are, you know, uh, artificial in terms of the pacemakers, whatever. It's not a race. But who thought you'd see someone run sub two in 2019? It is beyond the imagination. When well, the conversation first started for the sub two effort, I said, no way, no way in my lifetime will I witness the sub two hour marathon. I truly did not believe I would be able to witness something like this. Well, the pace car will be peeling away at 41 kilometers and then it'll be down to the pacemakers themselves to bring Elliot home and all being well, they will then peel off as well and leave Elliot to run home the final few hundred metres. 1.2 kilometres to go. He is almost there. He has one hand on history here in Vienna. There's Grace, his wife, looking on. She's never seen him race before in the flesh, remember. What a moment for her. What a moment for... What a moment for the children. The pace car is gone. We've lost the laser. He's it's getting now, one It's pace, now though. all down to Elliot and the pace The maker. gloves are off. He's this getting is, quicker. He's racing right now. This is, this is racing. Well, this is true racing. Shalane knows what this feels like through the streets of uh, Central Park in New York, whether it's in Berlin or London. But today is all about Vienna. Today is all about Elliot Kipchoge. We're down to the last couple of minutes to bring him home. Ed, some final thoughts from you. I'm overjoyed that particularly this man has got to do this. Uh, it's not just the barrier being broken. It's something that has existed in this person's head for so long. And I'm, it's so gratifying to watch, watch him achieve that. He's almost there. He can see the finish line. That's the view from Elliot Kipchoge. You can see the finish line where we are looming into view. 1.57 and approaching 158, I think we can say with some certainty there now he he's, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's right going there. He's Go on. to move away. Come on, he says. Come on, this is it. Shalane, a final this thought from you. This is incredible. Elliot's performance is such a gift to the world. His running is a gift to all of us. I feel so blessed to be here today. I feel like I hope everyone can hear me smiling through this microphone right now. I cannot stop smiling. 500 meters to go. He has the Hauptalle to himself. He's All the pacemakers have let him go. As Ed said, he is sprinting into the history books here. They're cheering him on. 400 meters to go. Let's bring him home. This is history unfolding on the streets of Vienna this morning. It's a Saturday run like we've never seen before. Listen at the noise, the crowd getting right behind him. Goodness me, 300 metres to go. He can see the finish line here. Neil Armstrong we had on the moon in 1969. We had Roger Bannister, the four-minute mile 65 years ago. Edmund Hillary, the first man to climb Everest in 1953. We have one minute to go. Elliot Kipchoge is on his way here. It's not this, gonna humble, be a minute. this humble farmer who used to run two miles to school every day and back. He used to go to the nearest town on his bike to sell milk at the local market. And now, through hard work and discipline, he's pointing. Come on, he says. Elliot Kipchoge has the hand of history on his shoulder. He has less than 200 metres to go. Elliot Kipchoge, let's keep an eye on the clock. Into the final 20 seconds. Eliot Kipchoge got his shoulder 140, oh. 140 for the unofficial oh, line. There's his wife. Eliot, Eliot Kipchoge storms into the history books in Vienna. 159.40, the unofficial time. The first man to run a marathon in under two hours. One final lung busting stride for Kipchoge. One giant leap for human endeavor. And you know. Kipchoge was right. No human is limited. And now he can celebrate. He has done it. And to Roger Bannister, Neil Armstrong, Edmund Hillary, we can now add the name of Elliot Kipchoge. Shalane, sum it up for us. Uh, 
I would like to just thank Elliot for sharing his gift with the world, with us. Today in the City of Dreams, he created an absolute masterpiece that will never be forgotten. Ed. That was absolutely beautiful. <laughs> that last kilometer was absolutely beautiful with his teammates cheering him on from behind. He's now been held aloft by all of his teammates. Uh, there's thousands of people <laughs> with cameras who want to hug him. There's a Kenyan flag. It's pandemonium at the finish line. He's going crazy. You wouldn't have thought he'd just run a marathon. No, he looks phenomenal. There are people crying in the crowd. Well, it was a, a very carefully choreographed plan for the finish, but that's completely been ripped up and thrown out of the window because Elliot Kipchoge is on. He's still got energy. How on earth do you have the energy to run like this after running at 13 miles an hour for two hours? There you can see the unofficial time. We may take a minute or two to make that the official time, but 159.40.2 is the unofficial time. Comfortably inside two hours and the olympic champion the world record holder the greatest marathon runner the world has ever seen is now in the history books oh. and they are going berserk right in front of our commentary position here we could just see his physio his long time physio He's crying uh, Pete, wiping tears away Peter, he is he is a tough guy who hurts people for a living he puts his thumbs deep in their muscles and he is weeping in front of our commentary box here uh, I there want is to give Grace, there a is hug. his wife. What on earth must she be thinking? You choose a race to go and watch your husband race for the first time. This is not a bad It's choice. a good one. It's a good yes. one. It's a good one. <laughs> I wonder what his kids are going to say later today. Oh, Dad, it's, it was okay. It was pretty good. <laughs> we see all the Kenyan flags here. This is such a big moment for Kenya, for East Africa, and it's incredible that we're watching this supreme athlete from uh, from Kenya do this on the world stage. There they are. His children watching on with great pride. And I wonder what Elliot is thinking as well, because anybody who's a parent knows that it makes a difference. It makes a difference to see and do something in front of your children. So it's been extraordinary here. We hope you've enjoyed our coverage from the commentary box. Thanks very much to Ed Caesar and to Shalane Flanagan. Brilliant insight and analysis as always. The celebrations, I'm sure, will last long into the night. We're going to repair somewhere for breakfast. But uh, Gabby, he's done it, and now he can party on the Prater. Chris Dennis, thank you so much. Shalane Flanagan, Ed Caesar, excellent work there in the commentary booth. But look at these scenes out here. I can't tell you the joy that is radiating from all of the pacemakers, the Ineos team. Everyone who has made this possible, his coach Patrick, he's been with since he was a young boy, grew up in the same village, and these scenes are joyous out here. The family as well, uh, Lynn, Jordan and Griffin, the children next to his wife Grace, just a little way away from us. They're, they're kind of overwhelmed by what their father and husband has done. He has made history. He has joined a pantheon of greats humans who push the limits and to be here amongst this crowd and see the reaction of people who are here is just a special special moment a real privilege to see and feel the atmosphere here there's a scrummage of photographers they're all desperate to get the shot the shot that they know will be uh, the one the shot of their lives potentially and amongst that throng just near me here is Radzi Chinyanganya who is eventually going to get his microphone under the nose of Elliot Kipchoge and you can see here Fran Miller bringing him forwards and uh, there is Elliot Kipchoge walking just past our commentary and studio position he's heading over here and may be able to get a little word oh, he's getting weighed he's going to get weighed at the moment this is a, such an important moment obviously for the team to get all his details get all his data in and Radzi's just next to us here as well Elliot's uh, doing the important science he's obviously got to get that data in they need this they need to make sure they know all the details They've got all of the information going forwards because Elliot Kipchoge will no doubt have another marathon to run. And he hugs team members of Ineos. He has the flag, the Kenyan flag aloft and hugs more team members. 
Fran Miller there. <laughs> An absolutely wonderful scene. Radzi's going to get his microphone in under his nose, I'm sure, any moment now, and we'll hear the thoughts of Elliot Kipchoge. He's a quiet man. He doesn't say a lot, but when he does, it is thoughtful. It's considered. He's such an intelligent figure, a real thinker of running. And there he is now with Radzi. Hi, Elliot. Radzi's... Good to see you, Elliot, but Radzi's going to have a chat with you. If you want to come on this side, Elliot, if we come this side, you, you have just made history. Yes, yes. You've become the first man to ever run a sub two-hour marathon. You've done it. Yes. How are you feeling? I am feeling good. Uh, it has taken 65 years for, for a human being to make history in sport. After Roger Panister made history in 1954, it took another 62, 63 years. I tried and I did not get. Uh, now it's 65 years. I have tried. I'm the happiest man to run under two hours in order to inspire ma many people, to tell people that uh, no human is limited. You can do it. I'm expecting more of the athletes in this all over the world to run under two hours after, after, after today. I mean, what incredible words. Inspiration doesn't do it justice. How hard was that run? How were you feeling at the very, the most painful part? Actually, I, I can't say and I can't find, but uh, the first thing is day when I wake up at five, uh, at 4.50, to actually the starting time, that's 8.15, it was my high hardest times even before the start. The time, actually, it was four hours, but it, it, it was like 30 minutes. So it was the hardest of times. But all in all, the race is actually, for, to the first kilometer is really hard the way it is. It needs actually the perseverance, it needs dedication, it needs uh, the, the, the hard to run. Yes. Your pacemakers were fantastic start to finish as well. Absolutely. Remember, the 41 pacemakers are among the best athletes ever in the whole world. From the Matthew Centro, it's the, one, the world cha Olympic champion for 1500, to all the marathoners and everyone, they are the best. I, I can say, uh, uh, I want to say thank you for them. I want to, to appreciate them for accepting to do the job. And, and, and together, it, it is not, uh, I am not telling you to talk with Mexico. we made this trip together in this one. Eli, to see the reaction that you had, especially from Kenya, with you growing up with a single parent mother, you're a proud member of the Talai clan. What does this mean to Kenya, especially? Uh, it means a lot to Kenya. Uh, I wanted to run under two hours in order to tell Kenyans that everybody can step out of this store and actually think uh, positively to what's required by, by a human being to do, and all of them can earn a good life. And together, you can make a, this world a running wall. And after run, making a running wall to uh, this world, you can make this world a beautiful wall and a peaceful wall. Uh, it's a genuine joy talking to you. It'd be remiss of me not to mention your wife and your three wonderful children as well, though. <laughs> Actually, my wife and my two children are giving me more support. I'm happy for them to come and witness the history. They will be among those who made the history. I'm happy for them. And just finally, Elliot, what image would you like us to take away from this? I'm, I, I, you genuinely made me cry watching you cross the finish line. What would you like us to remember about this? Uh, actually, I want to say uh, the positivity of sport. Actually, I want to make the sport uh, a clean sport. I want to make sport an interesting sport whereby all the human beings can run, can wake up very early in the morning, to run. And together when we run this world, we can make this world a beautiful world. You can kick away most of the diseases by just running. It, 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 it will be a beautiful one. It's a privilege talking to you. It was a privilege watching you run. And on behalf of every athletics fan around the world, yes. thank you very much. Thank you too. Thank you very much. Thank you to the whole world. Thank you to those who watched me through Facebook, those who watched me through YouTube, those who watched <laughs> uh, me live. And I can say, actually, I am appreciating your time that uh, you sit behind your TVs, behind your mobile phones, behind everything, even following uh, through Twitter and everything that uh, you have made this two together and uh, together you can make this world a beautiful world. Thank you very much. Elliot, you were great before. You are now an icon. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Immortal, I think. And when he says takes the time to watch me, well, you've made it a little bit less than it ever was, Elliot Kipchoge. And I think you can add to Radzi's words, it's not just athletics fans. I think it's human beings who are in awe and enamored and impressed by what we just saw. But there's one man that knows him perhaps better.